Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And this week we have a fucking gargantuan episode we're covering. Of course, the long-awaited follow-up to Black Country New Road's first album. We're talking about Ants from up there. Big, most anticipated album of the year, probably, from most people. And a, a smaller but still nonetheless beloved uh, band by a couple members of this podcast. A, a shout out to a recommended uh, uh, underrated artist. We're talking about post-hardcore band Rolo Tomasi's new album, Where where or When Myth Becomes Memory. I think it's, it's weird. Some, yeah, it's some long ass fucking title because they do that. But yeah, we're going to be talking about that album too. And this week, we're going to be talking about my recommended record, which is The Velvet Underground's White Light, White Heat. Big, important album, big, important band. Good discussion. Go tune in when that comes out. And this week on the channel, we have uploaded our very very longly anticipated video on the discography of the Dillinger Escape Plan. Uh, great video. We, I, I really liked getting to tear into those albums with Riley and Morgan. It was a great time. Go check it out. Get yourself into some fucking math core, man. And we also uh, uploaded a record club on the Tori Amos debut album, Little Earthquakes. Riley and myself got to tear into that. Uh, great little record, great little discussion. And not only that, we have guests aplenty this week for our different segments. There are going to be multiple people who join us for multiple different se segments, like, of course, Mr. Jacob Sanchez returning to the podcast. Hello. Welcome back. We love to see it. Mm -hmm. Damn. Uh, Jacob will be joining us for our review of the new Black Country New Road album, Ants From Up There. He'll also be joining us for our record club on the Velvet Underground's White Light, White Heat as well, so you can look forward to that. Then for Rollo Tomasi, we are joined by who better than Connor, friend of the podcast, frequent guest, lover of all things hardcore, lover of all things metallic, uh, will be joining us for that as well. So it's a pretty stacked episode. Mm -hmm. Let's get on with it then. First up is, of course, what we have been listening to in the last seven days. Jake, what have you been listening to? Well, it's interesting. We recorded our uh, episode on the Velvet Underground where the most of that discussion is basically talking about how that is just the ugliest, nastiest sounding album that's ever been put to tape. Uh, but uh, notably, not the ugliest album I listened to this week. If you remember a little bit further back, late into the year last year, I was, uh, I'm gearing to do uh, a project involving one of my favorite metal bands and one of the most influential and important rock bands of all time, that being Black Sabbath. And I, I kind of got to a point in the discography that's uh, considered a, um, let's call it a little bit of a lull, uh, maybe. And I, I ended off of uh, Never Say Die, which uh, memorably is uh, Black Sabbath's Yacht Rock era. Um, didn't care for that album in the slightest. And frankly, it's just there, there have been other things dominating my schedule. And I knew that everything after this is not going to be much better. So I was kind of hesitant. So finally, I broke the mold this week and I listened to Born Again, which I had a little bit of hope for because it was higher rated than Never Say Die. And it also has a new frontman, so we're, we're we're mixing things up. We're we're toying with some new stuff, uh, and then I listen to it, and oh god, it's hot shit. It's oh god, I'm I was begging, I was begging for Never Say Die. That's an album with almost nothing to enjoy. And I was like, God, what a blessing that was in comparison. Like, I'm I'm personally a bit offended that this album is higher rated than like the lesser Black Sabbath albums, frankly. Like it's still it's still kind of like not great and not well regarded at all. But like, do the people who've heard this album have ears? Like, what the fuck is wrong with all of you? Every Everything on this album is cartoonishly roughly recorded. Like 
it, it just sounds like every instrument was like overdubbed onto each other with its own wall of white noise. And it sounds so fuzzy. It sounds like the whole thing was a normal Black Sabbath album, except it was microwaved. And it sounds so awful. The, we talked, I remember Connor, when he was on the podcast last and we talked about Mastodon, he talked about how he didn't really care for the production of one of the more recent Mastodon albums, Emperor of Sand, and how the, the guitar solos on that album are a bit cartoonishly loud. Oh boy, howdy. Oh boy, this album was the blueprint for that because the mix of this shit is so quiet. I had to turn up my volume and then all of a sudden a guitar solo, which happens in every fucking song on this album just comes in like a bat out of hell and bludgeons you. It is so ugly sounding. The soloing is like impressive and good, but every song on here ends with just one and a half to two minutes of guitar wankery and it's all hidden behind the worst sounding metal production ever and god bless america the the vocalist does not do this band any favors this is genuinely this is black sabbath sounding like poison this is so hair metally and bad and fried there's a song on here called digital bitch i i I can't, I can't describe to you the levels of like, I, I saw this title and was like, all right, we're in for some cringe. And then I was actually listening to it. And I just like looked around when I was at work. I was just like, are you seeing this shit? What I, what, <laughs> what that you reminds me. this shit, Getty Lee? It reminds me of that, uh, <laughs> that, I think it's a vine where that guy like, um, just kind of smashes together two different like kids fucking toys. And he's like, robo bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, the hook on it is so cartoonishly awful it's just like the digital bitch it's just like what don't shut up don't say that like that i Jake, hate you one of the things i'm really looking forward to with this like late period uh black sabbath uh deep dive you're doing is seeing like how many times you say this is their worst <laughs> album <laughs> I mean, I, look, in my defense here, if if I could count on anything, it's you all definitely agreeing with me that in terms of the hierarchy of the, the tiers of this, it's just like, I was willing to find some goodness and shit like Technical Ecstasy, which is not a great album, but I would also just not say it's a bad album. But good lord, like, and the thing is, is that there are lower rated albums than this. Like, the next one is the Black Sabbath featuring Tony Iommi album because of all the band's fucking legal troubles, which is a whole story unto itself. But that one's lower rated than this one. And I'm just like, I can't fathom. Like, this is the worst sounding metal album I've ever heard. Uh, I, and it's like, <laughs> you can be like, oh, fucking Dark Throne. And I'm just like, no, Dark Throne sounds the way it does because that shit works for them. This does not do anything for this sound. This is genuinely just the worst sounding like metal record ever. Like I was literally sitting there and I was just like, is St. Anger better produced than this? And I was just kind of really thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, that, that album has a bit of an impact. It's, it's bad and it's like wet and sloshy, but uh, it's there. Whereas this is just like, <clears throat> but in terms of uh, highlights for new listens of 2022 albums, I listened to an album by Shoegaze band Cloak Room, their newest album, Dissolution Wave. Uh, got a shout out, Sergei here, who put this on my radar. Sweet Jesus, I love this album. Oh my God. It's a fascinating album because it has this entire concept behind it that's set in a universe that like this band has made with their previous albums and that it's like basically uh, like, it, it's kind of like a semi sci-fi dystopia thing. And the reason it's cool is because it's this album, Dissolution Wave, is told uh, from the perspective, like the, the songs are all by a man who is like a space miner, like a space coal miner dude. And he, they mix a kind of blues rock Americana with shoegaze. And the resulting combination is just absolutely fantastic. It's, a, it's not exactly like a long album or anything. I think it's like 38 minutes, but it feels so holistic they cover every single aspect of this sound like the opener gave me huge verve vibes uh like if you 
like shit like the first Verve album, that's going to be right up your alley. But there's other songs on here that blend stuff like blues a little bit more effectively and just synthesize it into this wonderful, very immersive, very emotional experience that feels very like the sort of space rock keeping with that. Like the concept of the album is cool, but it's, you know, it's a bit tertiary. But once that I figured that out and like read into it and stuff and sort of listened with a little bit of the lyrics, it's like, it really does add a sense of place and a sense of like cosmic, cosmic scope to the way this album sounds. Uh, currently, that's probably my front runner for album of the year. Wow. I, I've been listening to it frequently. I bought it on CD just so I can listen to it in my car. It's it's a lovely sounding album. I, I love everything about it. Apparently their other albums are a little bit different and less shoegazy from before this, but I still want to check them out. But it's such a unique combination and it's produced absolutely heavenly. There's so many different flavors and variations upon the sort of space rock shoegaze blues sound that they go into. And I can't get enough of it. It's infinitely re-listenable. I've uh, been spinning that multiple times this week. Sort of doing a, did a double Riley August core listen uh, yesterday where I finally after, I mean, finally like this, it, like this is on me when it's really for the fact that it's a fucking two hour long album is that I revisited XI, All Techers XI for the first time since, gosh, the year we started the podcast is when I first heard that one. Because I think that was the third All Tecker record I heard after Amber and uh confield and that's you know that's a two hour long album it's the it's sort of the latter half of the career of autecker and like i liked it a lot but it was still something that like i needed to develop my understanding of the band and the genre a little bit more to fully like grasp it and lo and behold i've fully grasped it oh fuck i i i know we collectively just absolutely suck this band's dick every single time they're basically mentioned on here but look i i'm gonna go back and i'm gonna try and re-listen to everything including the few blind spots i have i think i have i haven't listened to um choristus uh draft or uh nts yet so i i still need to get to those but as of right now i want to say xi is my favorite um mainly it's it's just it, it's like the two hour runtime stops being a hindrance and starts being the best thing about the album is that it's just two hours where not a second of it's wasted every song is incredibly dynamic as an amazing progression to it like god the opening fucking track on that is just sensational and it's not even like one of the three best songs on the album every little sonic world that this thing inhabits is that like, you know, it begins to be a two hour long experience. And I'm like, I wouldn't mind if this was two hours longer. I'd, I'd sit here through it. I don't care. Um, and then and, and it, they did it in 2016. <laughs> they did and it even better, twice. in my opinion. And, and that's what makes the me excited to explore stuff like that. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm just happy that like, I really love finding longer albums like that because it's like one of my favorite things about music is that I can get lost in it. And that's what Autech are great at is they're great at making worlds you can get lost in. And this is the one that I find the most immersive. It's it's really neck and neck with Oversteps because that's also like a very similar, um, similarly enveloping kind of experience, but for totally different reasons. Like the rhythm and like percussive qualities of XI are almost like, mirrored of the the melody centric parts of something like oversteps but i am i like them about the same but it's just it's just a matter of fact that i think xi has more variety and mm -hmm. it's like it's like the world's best musical anthology film or something like it's just everything is so evocative on there it feels like the the epitome of their career I was waiting for this day jake for so long i knew i had a feeling deep down that that album would click with you when you were ready like, that's so when you were ready to give it the time that it kind of demands of you but um i'm also like i was i also saw this coming in the sense that like after doing our sophie video and after doing our arca video in particular yeah and seeing yeah. how much you developed in terms of like your taste in electronic music since we first started the podcast with those videos i was like it's a matter of time this motherfucker is gonna we and here we are i mean it's it's what i said to you in our group dm last night and one of the things that i think is maybe the best way of even selling this record is that of all the your records i would say xi is the one that has the most 
has the best flow to it from start to yeah. finish like it is just this it's this very continuous uh, listening experience that never feels jagged that never feels like start stop at any point you are mm. kind of being pulled along through these waves of music some tracks will run into others some tracks won't have transitions but they will still feel like they had to be placed exactly where they were one of the cool things about that album is that you can experience it as a sort of two cd uh two halves record but you can also yeah. the way they originally uh envisioned the album was as a four lp thing where it has four distinct sides as opposed to two and one cool thing that they said in an interview is that you can interchange the four sides of the album and change the order in which the four sides are played oh. and the record will still flow uh, well. In the, and I've tried that before and for somehow they're fucking right. Uh, I think the, the way they sequenced it and the album is the most perfect way it could have been sequenced, but it actually works if you like. I don't have the vinyl, but if I did, you the idea is that you could just play Ooh any of the four sides in any order and just experience it in that way it's a really cool album uh it has so many of the best or tracks on it i mean blade lords is probably blade the, lords blade lords is probably the most beloved or track among fans top, uh, top three for me probably i still think fold free casual is their best but that's not far behind frankly yeah i mean i'm i'm hey i'm with you man um yeah i better i need to stop myself because otherwise i will just not <laughs> stop talking but yeah I'm 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 very very vindicated today. I had a bit of a marathon uh, with sort of like landmark electronic albums that I had heard before, but revisited and all liked a lot more. Uh, the other being, of course, Boards of Canada's Geogaddy, which I talked about listening to for the first time last year. And I'm not going to say anything about that album other than I really really like it because who knows somebody might talk about it in the future. Uh, but the last thing I'll mention is that I put on an. I, I'm really sad that I got into this artist as early on as I did because it was right before we started the podcast and I feel like I would have had a phase where I like talked about this even more because it's a very popular very acclaimed artist um, with like who's I think by wider music circles dismissed to be a singles artist because he admittedly has a lot of great singles that get tons of radio play or in a thousand movies uh, but that is I got really into the discography of Elton John the, the year we started the podcast. Um, he has some albums that are literally just front to back fucking masterpieces. And I, I feel like he doesn't get the credit that he deserves with it. Albums like Mad Men Across the Water or Honky Chateau or Captain Fantastic, all of them incredible records that I love front to back. Um, but one of the albums that I think is stood as sort of the benchmark for him and sort of like his his big crazy coked out album with a ton of singles but also a bunch of songs no one else has ever heard is a uh, goodbye yellow brick road which is it's it's not a perfect record but almost kind of by design in that that's an album where he literally just like i am going to do fucking everything the first song on goodbye yellow brick road is elton john's best song uh it is a prog pop opus called fucking funeral for a friend slash uh uh, I think it's like Love Lies Bleeding, and it's amazing. Like the first half of it is some of the coolest like instrumental buildup shit uh, in all of pop rock music. And then the second half is just like the best fucking hooks and chorus he ever wrote. And then you have the singles on there. You have Goodbye Yellow Brick Road and shit like that. And yeah, it's awesome. But there's also songs on there that just don't get the credit they deserve. Uh, I've seen that movie too, one of my favorite Elton John songs. Um, the weird irreverence of something like Jamaica Jerk Off, which I have a very, very odd fondness for just because, I don't know, man, it's silly as fuck and I love it. But also there's just shit on, you know, Candle in the Winds on that one too. And really, really the first four songs on that album are like classics. I haven't heard it, but I have heard all of those songs. And look, the, the album doesn't really dip necessarily after those songs either. I think that like, it's sort of a concession of like, yeah, the album's probably too long. And there are some songs that are obviously just not going to touch the, the, the incredibly high standard. And you probably shouldn't listen to this as your first one. Listen to Madman Across the Water first or Honky Chateau. Um, Cause they have a great balance of singles and deep cuts that people don't give enough credit to. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, it's just, it's so adventurous and fun and sprawling. It has so many different kinds of genres. Uh, also, I, I got to shout out All the Girls Love Alice, which is just John Lennon throwing 
throwing one out to the lesbians. Thanks, man. That's 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 cool of you. This is pretty nice. Uh, go listen to Elton John. Maybe, maybe don't phrase John Lennon throwing things out to women. Maybe don't phrase it like oh, that. Not John Lennon. Didn't you, you say John Lennon? You, you did. Um, say, oh, I'm just. You did stupid. say John Lennon. Yeah. I want to fucking shoot myself, Elton John. Uh, just upstairs. Uh, because I'm home for the first time in like a month or so. My parents rearranged my room and uh, made the, uh, the sort of turntable more accessible. <laughs> and as such, my dad has bought some jazz records. Um, and one of the ones that he had opened up was uh, Davis was around about midnight. So I threw that on while yeah. waiting for this space to open up. And uh, uh, I think that was his first at the very least it was his first breakthrough uh it was his first on i forget which label it, it was. was first on columbia yeah columbia that's it oh uh, yeah. yeah one of his first breakthroughs in general and I, I i i might be wrong but i don't think there are any original compositions on it uh i think it wasn't until the next year's milestones where you had the title track on that record which is notable for being the first ever post bop piece that miles i composed oh. i think and which paved the way for kind of blue but round about midnight uh is like yeah it's kind of just the current quartet in that era kind of flexing their muscles they also recorded four records i think around the same time as they made that album uh working cooking steam and, and rolling that the label then released over the next like 10 years but they were all recorded in 55 56 i think anyway yeah round of midnight is um yeah. Kind of just establishing the new quartet yeah I, I think it's essential in davis's canon just for that reason if it isn't even if it isn't one of his like way up there ones uh it's uh other thing i will mention is uh, at the uh the impetus of the new everything everything single being released raw yeah. data feel uh which uh, last FM is now showing 49 scrabbles of just that song. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've gone back to, I don't, I haven't been able to listen to Fever Dream in full yet, uh, but I've gone back to a bunch of my favorites on that record. Um, and I naturally, I listened to Get to Heaven again. And I mean, yeah, that, we, you know, we, I think we've talked collectively more about get to heaven on this podcast than we have any other record um deservedly it's it's great boy i mean you know what are you gonna do <laughs> yeah on the note of that um new everything everything song bad friday like uh great song i especially want to just shout out the music video because this one thing this band like we've sucked this band's dick so many times collective dick so many times but one thing we kind of maybe don't haven't talked about enough is how good they are at making music videos and that's one oh, of the yeah. things that they've really gotten better and better at like reanimator had like five music videos and they were all very unique and very creative and very distinct from each other one for but, super normal that one's fucking oh yeah crazy. that one's insane um, uh -huh. but, but the new video for bad friday is like this like uh black and white thing where they're like it's just and it infuses like uh elements of ai and stuff and it's just really super creative and fun and it's just awesome to see this band that have like even as people are kind of i guess general audiences are sort of moving away from them the further they get from get to heaven they're sort of sort of still like staying fresh and creative and and um the new album itself has its has a really cool sort of like high concept as well that i'm really awesome. excited to get into but um that's for later in the year uh okay so what have i been listening to for the last week well quite a lot obviously because we are already in for a lengthy episode i am gonna try and be as brief and punctual as possible about what i've been listening to i've essentially committed myself this year to try and listen to 20 albums 20 new albums each month and so i've achieved that target with january and i'm working on it with february already and so basically all of the albums i'm going to shout out today uh, all bar one are albums from this year. The first album I'm going to talk about today is a record that I discovered looking through the radio music charts. In fact, a lot of these records I discovered looking through the radio music charts for this year so far from a band I'd never heard of before. It is a slowcore record 
uh, and the band, by a band called 40 Watt Sun, who used to be known for making doom metal, but have gradually kind of transitioned into sort of slow core singer songwriter kind of even slightly Americana-esque music. And they put out a new record this year called Perfect Light, uh, which has gradually worked its way into my favorite albums of the year so far. I've listened to about 35 albums from this year so far. And this is one of the top five. Um, this album is stunning. It is beautifully, pristinely produced. The songwriting is absolutely incredible, uh, devastating, heartbreaking. This album is sad as hell, but it is beautiful. It is gorgeous. Uh, the arrangements are slow. The songs are long, but they are hypnotically gorgeous. Jacob, I know you listened to this album this week as well. Um, so you can kind of, this I, I did and sort of, I did put you onto it and it's just one of the most beautiful records I've heard in a very long time. Uh, I think in particular, Jake, you'll enjoy this album. It has very much your uh, feel to it. Like, well, It's not a shoegaze record at all, but one of the bands I did think of at certain points while listening to it was Slow Dive. And uh, it just has that same kind of feel to it. And also there are songs where it's mostly kind of really crisp and beautiful acoustic guitars, but there are songs where he plays an electric guitar and you have like these gorgeous electric guitar tones that are very like Opeth-esque. Let's just say like Damnation was another album I thought of while listening to this. Not to, I know that's obvious bait, but it is also just true. Um, so yeah, that album is great. Absolutely highly recommend it. Not a lot of slowcore music is actually as lyrically br brilliant as this album is as well. So that's something I think that elevates it uh, above the others. If you need a good album to put on and just be sad to or even have a cry to, I can't think of a better one that's come out this year. Uh, I want to shout out an album from that did not come out this year that I was put on to by August. And it is a classic country record. Uh, from 1969 wow. called The Gilded Palace of Sin by the Flying Burrito Brothers. Now, the Flying Burrito Brothers are a band that formed from multiple members of the Birds, uh, the classic 60s pop band, uh, most notably, God, they had so many members, uh, Graham Parsons and Chris Hillman of the Birds formed this yeah. band called the Flying Burrito Brothers, uh, August shouted this album out like eight months ago in one of our What We've Been Listening To segments, and he gave it such high praise that I'd always wanted to check it out ever since. And now that I did, I feel like, uh, now while I, my knowledge of country and country rock music is very limited, this feels like a foundational album for the genre. Obviously, country existed long before the late 60s, but this is the moment where country music songwriting gets infused with the kind of studio production and instrumental focus that came with records like Pet Sounds and with records in the late 60s and proper rock and roll. So you get this album that is kind of very plaintively beautiful and sad lyrically in a way that feels very in tune with country music aesthetics, but also infuses some of the more subversive aspects of 60s pop songwriting and the more fulsome sound design of some of the best 60s rock bands as well. So Gilded Palace of Sin by the Flying Burrito Brothers gets a big tick from me for that reason. Another record I want to shout out is I've been listening to a lot of Grouper lately. I know August has been as well. Uh, and so Grouper put out a side project album this week, I think, or about a week ago. From for The side project is called Realm, and the new album is called Daughter. And I've been a bit iffy on Grouper's last few years of material. I think the last re release from her that I've really, really connected to is, of course, Paradise Valley, which is one of my favorite EPs of all time. But that came out in like 2017. And ever since then, Grouper's releases have kind of just evaded me. They've just been a little bit too kind of not quite there. And Daughter is certainly a minimal record, but... It's a drone record, as you would expect from Grouper, but it has such richness in the sound. It has gorgeous drone melodies, and it ends with an absolutely stunning 20-minute piano drone uh, that, I, that absolutely took my breath away. And so if drone music and pretty ambient music appeals to you at all, I highly recommend chucking on this Realm album. It's very easy to just put on in the background while you're doing whatever, and it is of all the records that I've listened to this week, 
alongside the perfect alongside the 40 watt sun album this record has brought me a lot of necessary peace uh because it's been a shit time in my life recently and i've really gravitated to music that can help me feel like so just relaxed and at peace and the realm album does that uh, i want to shout out a record from an artist called cities aviv uh, an album called man plays the horn now i was not aware of this artist before this week but when the rate your music chart updated this album was number three of the year uh, and so i of course looked it up checked it out uh, Cities Aviv is an abstract hip hop artist, and this is kind of his magnum opus to this date. It is, so let me sell this to you. If you like Mad Lib production, if you like Jay Diller production, if you like really densely produced and really energetic hip hop that has a, a mostly instrumental focus, I think the instrumentals are a bit stronger than the performances sometime. But if that kind of hip hop appeals to you, where you're just getting great beats, if you like last year's Little Ugly Main album, for instance, this record will be for you. It is a really enrapturing experience. It is a long album, it's 80 minutes long, but you have 26 tracks. And it feels very much like the kind of Jay Diller-esque thing where you're just kind of cycling through these various different beats and these various different songs that have these quite energetic performances. So if you're into that sort of thing, I highly recommend this album, Man Plays the Horn by Cities Aviv, uh, a really, really interesting project. I'm actually looking forward to revisiting it and getting to know it a bit better. Okay, I'll shout out two more albums. The first is the worst album of the year so far that I've heard. Um, this is the worst album ever released. Uh, I, I listened to two kind of nadirs of the year this week. One was a new EP from Kim Petras called Slut Pop, which is Drek. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more, not even really much more, but I want to focus in on the new Alt-J album, The Dream. And that's not because I want to talk about the new Alt-J album, The Dream. Not at all. It is the most boring album of the year so far. It is actively not musical for extended periods of time. And I don't mean, oh, it sounds bad. I mean, there's extended periods of time on this album where you're just getting what effectively amounts to silence and barely present musicality. It is an invisible album. But I don't want to talk about it. Because I, I just wanted to mention this because it got me thinking about Alt-J for the first time in fucking years. Um, and this is their first album in five years. And I just started thinking about the wave of indie pop, of like indie tronica pop that, had this, that has this kind of like sort of hipstery uh, sensibility. And I, I think of it as post-Vampire Weekend indie pop. Now, Vampire Weekend are a band... <laughs> that I enjoy. I enjoy their albums to varying degrees, all four of them. But they are responsible for a wave of bands in the early 2010s who I now find to be insipid to the nth degree. And I will be upfront. A lot of this is because I did listen to a number of these bands when I was like 17, 18. I had girlfriends who were into these bands. I had friends who were into these bands. Bands like Alt-J, bands like Glass Animals, bands that like foster the people and all this kind of, these kind of peppy, kind of funny kind of bands that have these kind of like, try to inf have this kind of African influence stuff that follows in the wake of what Vampire Weekend did with their first record. And I just find all of it to be so insufferable now. I just can't deal with any of it. And to me, having to think about Alt-J again, because they had a new album out, and because I'm trying to listen to as many new records as I can, I was infuriated to even be reminded of their existence. And in many ways, I think this new record is representative of the end result of the insipidness of all of that music, which is just that it runs out of steam. Like, it runs out of steam so quickly, and what you are left with is fumes. This album is one hour long. And it is fumes the entire time. It is dead air. No. I'm going to finish my segment off here by talking about what is fighting the new Cult of Luna album for the mantle of best album of the year so far, in my opinion. It's an album that, again, I only discovered this because of the Rate Your Music charts. And also, 
it's two and a half hours long. So if I wasn't committed to this listening to our highly rated new records project, I definitely would not have heard this. And that would have been a real shame because this album is... Look, I realize we all live busy lives. We all have a lot of shit going on. We all have to listen have to find room for all these records so we can do this show but the new album from korean pop artist yaya kim which is called aka yaya is essential listening this record blew my mind uh, it is a jazz pop art pop record but even calling it that is to undersell it uh, it broadly remains within that wider swath of like jazzy pop music, jazzy kind of art, art house sort of pop music, but it does so many different things genre wise within that umbrella. There are elements of trip hop, of techno, of lounge music, of Latin tango music, of, of all kinds of genres and subgenres that are infused here. This album has something like uh, 33 songs across two hours and 20 minutes it has three distinct discs and each of the three discs is billed as its own genre and i think that they're not quite as different from each other as that might make them sound but there, there is a distinction between each disc of the record and the thing about it is every single song is great somehow this is an album with 33 songs that never runs out of steam. If anything, it gets better. I mean, if I had to pick a least great of the three discs, it would probably be the first one, and it's pretty fucking great. What Yaya does on this record is astounding in terms of her versatility as a performer, in terms of how great of a show person she is, in, in terms of how she effortlessly manages to pick up and master each different little genre style, each different little thing that she tries. Look, if you aren't in the mood for two hours of jazz-influenced art pop music, this may tire you out. I mean, shit, I was pretty tired by the time it was done. But crucially, there was no point at which I ever considered stopping listening to the album. I just put it on and it just, it became so easy to just let it run through. Just as soon as you think she has exhausted all the possibilities of the sound that she's working with, she'll bring another fucking great song out of thin air and make you go damn now i don't think any there's anything on here that would be make you go like this is the greatest song of the year this is one of the greatest songs of all time it's not that kind of record it's kind of like um the only comparison i can really think think of is like the magnetic field 69 love songs but even that isn't really a fair comparison because that's all over the place that has some tracks that don't work as a part of its identity and just the nature of what it is. Whereas this is so holistic, so beautifully flowing that I am in total awe of it. Like it is really remarkable. And I don't blame anyone who doesn't have the time to listen to this, but I would say at least check out some of it. The third disc in particular is outstanding, but actually the second disc is probably the best one but all three are, are so great. Like it's a really exciting record. And what's really exciting about it is that a lot of the music on here that Yaya is doing is not music that is like in vogue, like all this Latin pop music, all this jazz pop music, all this kind of trip hoppy influence stuff. Like it's not stuff that's popular at the moment. Whereas if you are listening to the latest uh, post hardcore band or the latest post punk band or the latest like electro pop thing, it's, it, it might be great, but you're inundated with bands like that. And so the best case I can make for Yaya Kim is that she gives you something you didn't know you needed. And yeah, that gets my highest recommendation. Jacob, anything that you want to shout out that you've been listening to in the last week? I'll shout out a few. Um, I have been very sick recently. It's not COVID, but I've needed albums that like, needed to help me relax and so one album i kind of listen i listened to that has been giving me this very peaceful feeling is steve reich music for 18 musicians which i thought that was beautiful and i really really loved the recording production the performances on all of that and the melodies like just this absolutely like it feels very transcendent 
And I guess that's what I kind of needed, as well as being very, very relaxing as well. Another album I'll shout out is um, Christian Death, Only Theater of Pain. Amazing goth rock album. Definitely, I feel like all of y'all would absolutely adore this. This came out in 1982. Had me at goth. Yes. Oh, and the, the lead singer is basically probably... Roz Williams feels like he'd be the poster child of the goth movement. And uh, like, even though they were like, they weren't British, they were in LA hard, like not LA, but they, their roots weren't hardcore. Like their guitarist came from the adolescence and there's a great mix of goth and hardcore punk that just meshes perfectly on this record. Like uh, just listen to the first track and if that's your speed, you will be absolutely in. What else did I want to shout out? Um, Yellow Magic Orchestra, Solid State Survivor. I was aware of Ryuichi Sakamoto, of course. Like, uh, the goat. 1996 is an incredible goddamn album, but I never knew he had basically helped invent synth pop like him and the other members of the band. And fucking Solid State Survivor is a glorious goddamn record. It has like these fucking melodies that are just transcendent. And it basically seems to like it invents the entire 80s aesthetic and sound. And it came out in fucking 79. Absolutely wonderful, beautiful record. I listened to the new, speaking of pop records, I want to shout out the new Mitski, which after a couple of listens, I finally started to click with it a little more. It's not the it's not her best record. I would say it's maybe my least favorite of the albums I've heard from her. But honestly, only Heartbreaker is catchy as hell. Like there are a couple of moments on that record in which I don't know, I think she's really good at pop songwriting. In some ways, I think maybe the reception of that album, I feel like people were already starting to like nail its like nail its coffin on it because like she already had so many people that she had to please, whether it be the TikTok fan base, like uh, who started like dancing to nobody or like her old fans who want to bury me, at, bury me at make out Creek too. But honestly, I came away from this record satisfied. It was like, again, not a perfect pop record, but I enjoyed yeah. it. I want to take the opportunity to just, touch on this a little bit as well because we were originally going to review this but then you know i eventually decided that it's probably not going to spark enough joy to be worth its own full segment but i have been re-listening to it as well i was initially pretty underwhelmed by it what i will say in terms of nailing the coffin shut before it came out is that i definitely did sense some of that in the ear like obviously mitski's stan army who she has been very publicly deeply discomforted by and is the reason why she hasn't been on social media for several years because she's almost scared and off put by how much people love her and that is a big part of what influences her songwriting as an artist now as well as the the obligation to write music i mean lead single working for the knife is explicitly about that about how she feels like kind of just a tool that's being used and how she has yeah. to make music no and she doesn't can't really make music as much for passion anymore as much as just having to fulfill obligation and i don't want to I don't want to project too much here and say that Mitski was completely uninspired while making this album because I don't necessarily think that is the case but I do think there's this feeling of kind of like malaise and a sense of kind of stagnation that doesn't really feel present on any of Mitski's previous records like from Bury Me onwards each album kind of has its own identity has its own set of unique sort of sonic things that it does whereas this is the first album where it feels like Mitski is kind of spinning her wheels and doing sort of the same sort of thing that she did on Be the Cowboy but the quality of the songwriting and the sweep that that album has is just not here present here that said some of the songs have grown on me. I think Working for the Knife is a pretty strong track. I originally thought it was mid as hell, but it's grown on me a good bit. Uh, Stay Soft, which I still have think that the chord choices in that song are, and vocal melodies in that chorus are really strange. Um, but I've gone from being put off by them to being kind of like intrigued by them. It's a very kind of 
the way she vocalizes in that song is very sort of unusual. And I think lyrically, it has some of the strongest sentiments of the record as well. Uh, the Only Heartbreaker, which was the second single, I think, again, a wise choice for a single. It doesn't do much for oh, yeah. me. To me, that song is like too obviously a pastiche of like 80s pop songs. Like when that when it starts, it's like, oh shit, you're literally just taking the, the drum part that opens Aha's Take On Me and you're literally just doing the synths and stuff. And it's literally just like another, you know, template version of that. But she sing her vocal performance on the song though is really strong. I think she does elevate the song a little bit above that. Uh, Love Me More is another highlight as well. I think she has some really powerful vocal presence on that. The closing track, That's Our Lamp, is a jaunty number that you would not expect from a Mitski closing track. They're normally quite dour, but that's a nice little surprise. Uh, the one song I want to shout out, though, the biggest highlight of the record for me, and I think one of Mitski's best songs, is Heat Lightning, which is a moody yeah. song. It's a slower song. It took some time to grow on me, but there's a unique kind of power to Mitski's performance here. It's understated. It's, it's melancholic as hell. The song is quite dreary and sad, but it also has these punchy sort of um, electronic drum parts at certain points as well that give it this kind of edgy feeling. And also the, the vocal melodies are strongest here as they are on the whole album. And the sentiment is just classic Mitski to me. This song could fit right in on Puberty 2. I think yeah. it's one of her best songs. Uh, so while I've seen a lot of people dismiss this offhand, and while I do understand it, because I do think on the whole it's a middling record, where the they there the best parts of it are kind of like ideas within songs as opposed to whole songs, I do still think it deserves better than to just be dismissed outright. I think there's some good right. stuff here, and I think that with um, some new because she's worked with the same producer for several records now. I think I think with some new kind of a new set of collaborators, a new, hopefully some new inspiration. Mitski could, again, go back to doing that thing that she's so great at doing of being this kind of chameleonic musical figure who can push indie rock into so many different directions. I just think that this record isn't quite that. I know a lot of the songs in this record were actually written around the time of Be The Cowboy, and that knowledge yeah. kind of leaves it feeling a little bit like a B-sides album, uh, which is unfortunate. I know that this is the last album with her con like that she had to record for her label. So that honestly now makes me curious as to what her future is going to be like. And I'm excited about it. Yeah. All righty. Let's move in to our first review of the day, which is, of course... Black Country, New Rose, New Album ants from up there which it's worth noting was released 364 days after their first album for the first time which we covered on this podcast at this time last year i remember it well black country new road were kind of well they weren't actually the first windmill scene band that we covered we actually covered shame a couple of weeks beforehand but i think that it's fairly safe to say black country new road were the first windmill scene band and by windmill scene band i mean a specific scene of uk based art rock post-punk influenced bands that have this particular kind of style that's very sort of angular that's very sort of like uh existential and modern and all that sort of thing i think bcnr were the first in, the, in that wave of bands that we covered that really like leapt out in terms of you either love this or you hate this, in inspiring strong opinions. And what the thing that always always struck me about BCNR is, and I'm not even sure like where this comes from because it's a culture that I am totally alien to. Evidently, a lot of windmill scene bands, Black Midi, of course, being another one, have feverish fan bases, seemingly across the world, but I'm sure it's all localized primarily in the UK. And I think I've spoken about this before as well. It seems to likely be a product of the fact that these are homegrown bands. These are bands that came up through live shows. These are bands who came up through forging intimate connections with fans by, by being these small bands that fans could actually connect with on a, on a personal level that would then increase their popularity in a kind of feedback loop where the bands get bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more people get attached. And they're... Definitely an example of 
a musical fad that's really in fashion at the moment. Like we have these kinds of musical fads in the alternative world all the time. And BCNR seem to be perhaps even eclipsing Black Midi with this new record as the most popular of these bands. Uh, to the extent that this particular album, I believe, got a best new music from Pitchfork, which might you know, not mean anything to any of you, but to me, this record getting acknowledged and the band getting kind of fully propped up as one of the bands of the moment by a, a, a website like Pitchfork really shows that this scene has risen above the UK alternative to kind of invade the States, to kind of just be this big part of alternative music broadly and generally. Um, because a lot of that UK alternative music does get ignored in the US. And here it's like, well, BCNR can't be ignored anymore. Another thing that's interesting about Ants from up there compared to for the first time is that while we talk about this wave of windmill bands being like angular, post-punky, sort of uh, existential malaise about the modern world, Ants from up there, I, I would say, departs pretty strongly from most things resembling post-punk. This is much more of an art rock record. This is much more of an indie rock record at certain points. This is much more of a post-rock record in a lot of ways as well. It has this sense of uh, depth and sort of variety in the instrumentation that was certainly present to some extent on for the first time but that's a record that feels quite just really tightly wound where all the compositions are kind of like refined and this is a record that kind of breathes more it has more space in these songs it has more sense of kind of expansion it has obviously that original record has sunglasses, one of their sig signature songs, which is a nine minute kind of epic that sweeps outward. But still, compared to some of the bigger songs on this record, it makes that feel like, you know, a pop track by comparison. This is a record that really showcases a band being more ambitious than I would have even given them credit for. And of course, ambition doesn't equal quality. Uh, one of the things that we've kind of forecasted, if you've been following us on Twitter, is that this record's been a little bit divisive between us, which is only a good thing, in my opinion. Um, and a big aspect of why this album, I think, is so interesting to talk about, obviously, we're going to talk a lot about the music itself, but I've mentioned the feverish nature of people's reactions to this. Like, it's already, I think, in the top, I think it's already ranked like 113 in the all-time albums list, on Rate the Your Music. 4.0, which is basically all you need to know. And it has like, and it, this is not just, it, and it has like ten, over 10,000 10, ratings. And that, of course, and I always feel the need to emphasize this when we bring up Rate Your Music, that is one community that attracts a certain type of people. But it's still reasonably good gauge for what young people who listen to music outside of just the top 40 are into right now. And the feverishness of it creates a certain level to which it becomes difficult to approach and appreciate as just a record full of music. I want to turn first to Jacob as our guest, and I want to ask you specifically one thing, which is, what is your perspective on the hype surrounding this band? Like, what is your perspective on how feverish and intense people are about their love of this band? I mean, obviously I've given some reasons what, of things that I think contribute to that, but what's your perspective on why people go so crazy for Black Country New Road? Okay, so where I come to Black Country New Road, I heard their album like the week it came out because I had heard all the hype like for the first time. And I remember thinking to myself, these guys have, I, I understood why people were going insane over them because they showed a shit ton of potential on that first record. But I guess I just really couldn't, even though I do really like that record to this day, I couldn't really emotionally connect with it. But I get why a lot of people were absolutely foaming at the mouth over this record. Because it seems like I don't want this to be like, okay, this is why this band is so appealing to me because I think they're musically creative. I think they're absolutely great at compositions. Like they're, my second favorite track of theirs is their opening track, which is like my third favorite song of the year, instrumental. Uh, like, I think that's a stunning, stunning piece of work. But a lot of the lyrics do kind of seem like they would appeal to music critics, to music nerds. 
like uh, references to Kanye West, references to Scott Walker, like lyrical references that are interpolations of other songs. You see that a lot on this record as well. So I think you will already have those moments that will connect to young music fans, young music lovers who are, you know, starting to expand their taste. And, you know, like, uh, especially fans of Slint, they themselves have dubbed themselves the, the world's second best Slint tribute act. And so, yeah, that already is going to give you a fan base, especially because Slint is one of the most beloved bands of that scene so i definitely even though again i think that first album really good but i understand that the hype definitely came from music nerds music snobs who just like got those references and were like all right yes we get it like uh, they get it they get us i think that's there's some real truth to that especially the appeal of this kind of band to people who are quote unquote serious about music uh, I mean obviously I count myself as one of them like I'm not going to pretend I'm above all of this I'm not okay. but um, I think a big piece of context that we haven't mentioned yet that I think now I think this record would still have been really huge without this but I think there's a particular thing that happened just before this album was released that everyone who is familiar with this will know which is that the band's frontman, the very idiosyncratic let's just say presence of Isaac Wood announced he was leaving the band announced that he could no longer be in the band the way he phrased it was actually really interesting I can no longer be in the band or something to that degree and apparently something I've learned from subsequent things that other band members have said this was a decision that Isaac made last year but he chose to reveal this information just before the release of the album. Now, I'm not saying that there was anything untoward about that, but it's an interesting aspect of the story. And I'll touch on why I think it's relevant to the music itself uh, in a bit, because I don't want to speak too long without other people speaking. But I do think it explains to some extent why people have foamed at the mouth for this record in the way they have during the release week specifically, because what it gets at is an aspect of modern music culture that I find really fascinating that we've commented on a lot of times uh, that actually represents something that's an aspect of wider culture, even outside of music, which is the intense personality aspect in terms of the intense parasocial relationships that people create and form with artists that they love. The intense interest in the personal lives and the personalities and the moral goodness of whatever artist you're thinking about like 20 30 years ago people didn't give a shit about this stuff people liked bands people liked music people liked artists people in are, were interested in you know who they were for sure but we live in a current era where particularly young people are feverishly obsessed with understanding and getting inside of the personal lives of the artists that they love and so you have this artist who is beloved you have this front man of this band who people have formed such an, att an attachment to announcing that he's leaving immediately before an album comes out. That is so clearly from the outset, something that he has poured all of himself into and people are devastated. People are confused. People are surprised. People are shocked and people are energized by this. People want to understand. People want to be able to find within the music the meaning and I think that there is meaning baked into this music that relates to Isaac's departure from the band but it's just interesting to me how in my perception that event really was the thing that super intensified the hype for this album and the way that people reacted to it especially because a piece of context like that a departure of a band member there's no way that doesn't change the way you hear the record like and another good example that is not quite a one-to-one, -one, but I thought of while thinking about this this week, is when David Bowie died, like two days after Black Star came out. I remember listening to Black Star the day it came out, before David Bowie died, but I had friends who didn't hear it until after he was dead. And we had distinctly different experiences with that record the first time. Of course, him dying so quickly after the record came out 
my own experience with the record was colored retroactively by that but I'll remember the first experience I had with that album where I wasn't being informed by David Bowie is dying or dead. And I think that that can be analog an analogous situation here where now everyone listening to this album is informed by that perspective. I guess unless, I don't even know if the leak of this album was out before he announced his departure, but most people, if not everyone, will be experiencing it through that lens. And so I think that just adds an interesting dimension to it that could potentially explain some of the sociological aspects of this album and, and how people are responding to it, as well as why people like myself and you, Jacob, feel the way that we do, and why people like Jake and Morgan might feel the way that they do. Why some of us might feel a connection to the music or the record and why other of us might not. I'm not saying that that's the reason. I'm just saying that's an aspect that can feed into how we experience these records, depending on our connections to the band and our involvement uh, beforehand. So anyway, Jake, I'd love to hear from you at this point. I know you have got some extensive, extensive thoughts on this album. And I mean, where do you want to begin? <laughs> uh, God, I don't even really think there's a great place to begin. I, I guess if I want to frame this properly, the BCNR album that came out last year had a considerable kind of groundswell of hype because it wasn't really that everyone was looking forward to it. It was really that everyone knew that that was the year where the windmill scene bands were going to come out with a big, important project. And they all did. You had For the First Time, you had Cavalcade, and you had uh, Squid, uh, all that kind of shit, right? And when I listened to Black Country New Road, I was still kind of divorced from all of that. I only knew about it in a very tangential way. But as I became more entrenched in music discussion, it became clear to me that something was missing uh, in terms of my experience with a lot of my contemporaries, because I, I really liked that album. Um, I gave it a very positive rating. And well, I'll admit it has grown off of me a little bit, mainly because, you know, we have a lot of overriding things that bother us in the world of music criticism. And one thing with me is that when you have the kind of dry, irreverent humor in your music, there's no real way to do it right or wrong. It's just sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. But that led to a bit of a disconnect with me with for the first time, which is an album I find very musically compelling. And just as a singular experience, it's really tight. Uh, it's really exciting. And it's a good front to back listen. It's a very, very structurally sound album. And even if the lyricism and the things that they're talking about in that album don't quite fully click with me, I still feel like I can bring enough appreciation to the table to evaluate it on its own terms. So basically what I'm saying here is that the precedent for my opinion was nothing. I, I wanted to go into this with as little buzz as possible. And I did, because I, I listened to it a week before it came out uh, because I knew there was a leak. I didn't know what anyone was saying about it, even though I could probably guess. So I wanted to listen to this and just sort of like, you know, I get in before the, the hive kind of descends so I can understand it and really like try and get on its wavelength before any of that gets muddled because as much as I would like to say that kind of stuff doesn't totally affect us I think it does it's it's inevitably at least on a subconscious level going to do something to your opinion and I will admit as childish as it is there is a part of me that is very immature that like no matter what people say about bands like this and about for the first time there's a level of praise that people go to for it that just absolutely eludes me. Like there's a point where, you know, people like, you know, a lot of people are just like, oh, this is like one of the like best album of the year thing. This is a perfect album. And it's like, again, that childish part of me is just like, I don't get it. I, I just, the, the, the way this speaks to people is just not for me, I guess. So I, bear, you know, call a spade a spade, not for me. So then we get the couple singles that uh, were released with this album, right? I think the first, was the first one like Con? No, it was The Chaos first Space one was Marine. Chaos Space Marine, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I listened to a little bit of that, but I was just like immediately within the first minute of hearing that song, I was like, nope, need to hear this in the context of the album. Not even going to try. 
And then the single, I think, Snow Globes came no, out? No, the second one was Bread Song, I think, and then oh, Concord, okay. and then Snow Globes was the last single. I missed the two in the middle, but I got to Snow Globes. And I listened to that one just because the, the praise for that song in particular was really, really strong when that single dropped. And I heard it and I was just kind of like, my, my kind of worst fears were realized. It's just like, I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't understand. And I was just like, I'm not going to think about this. I'm going to wait till I hear it in the context of the album. I'm not even going to fully form my opinion. So I was not going into this like you know and i'm not coming at this from the perspective of the annoying person who i don't like the popular thing that everyone likes ha 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 i'm gonna be a bastard about it no i if anything this is the single most frustrating album i've ever listened to for this podcast um because not only did my opinion become more and more definite the more i listened to it my opinion became more and more harsh the more i listened to it and again when i'm surrounded by nothing but walls of overbearing praise i i'm i'm a it's a bit of the august effect i have a newfound sympathy for that man and what he must experience when a lot of people really really love an album and he just uh because there's just so much about this as an experience that i find tedious the structure of this record is not particularly wonky or anything i think it's pretty cleanly divided into like a first and second act as far as I can tell, with a sort of bridge in the middle there. And I'll admit, uh, the, the, I, I dig the first half sufficiently. I, I, I can kind of get into it there, but these songs just, they, they strike a terrible middle of the road approach for me where they end up uh, like appealing to like these, these songs feel like they're trying to do a whole lot and for me, end up doing nothing. And that's really pessimistic and harsh sounding. And I don't even necessarily mean that they're bad songs. I'm meaning more so that I'm sitting here listening to them and I'm just like, there is not a single emotion I feel while listening to this. There are exceptions to this. I think that there are moments in certain songs that I'm admittedly not crazy about, like the final third of Chaos Space Marine, which I think builds to a pretty like really raucous and rowdy conclusion there at the end, even if it kind of peters out for whatever reason at the end of the song. And everyone has been losing their mind over the place where he inserted the blade. That's a great song. No, no complaints from me whatsoever. Uh, yes, it leans into the fact that it, I, I've said it a lot, this really sounds like a late era Bright Eyes song, but I like late era Bright Eyes. I don't care. You don't have to be original. However, put a pin in that, this is an experience that I find frustrating too, because this is an album and a project that wears its influences so much more cleanly on its sleeve than the first album does, which is not inherently bad. And I think it's funny too, because they were, you know, all these talks and comparisons to Slint and they referred to themselves as the worst, you know, the best Slint tribute band. I never really thought they sounded all that much like Slint. And especially not on that first album. In fact, I think if anything, this one sounds more like Slint, but regardless, it leads to the fact that I don't feel the same wavelength of originality that I did in the first album. That album to me has a much more defined identity. This album is shaggy. All of these songs have really winding structures and they're really dynamic songs, but dynamic for me is a neutral term because honest to God, I feel like there's like a solid minute to two minutes of each one of these tracks that could be shaved off and I would feel no different. There are just parts of the structures here that elude me, that don't feel like they build to anything. They just happen, stop, and then something else happens as an instrumental idea, which again, I like it when that happens sometimes, but it happens almost every single song on here after that first initial run of tracks and it becomes monumentally frustrating to digest this is such a it, it's an album that is so restless and in that respect i completely understand why people would latch on to the restlessness the dynamism uh how structurally adventurous this is but to me it reads black country new road as biting off so much more than they can chew they, they are trying actively to make their big sophomoric effort. And 
I mean, I guess they succeeded judging based off of the reactions of everyone else on planet Earth that isn't me. But to me, it feels like a sophomore slump because they're trying to do too much and I don't feel anything from any of it. There are songs that ha exist here like, yeah, I know this is probably going to be low hanging fruit, but the whole in, uh, edition of a song like Mark's theme, for instance, is too short to be a defined song on here, but also just too long to be an interlude. And then it just exists. And it also has sort of a live recording feel about it, which means it really stands out in the terms of the sound of the album, which is also regrettably something that really bothers me. Talking about the dynamic structure of the album, you know what else is dynamic is the instrumentation. There's a lot of it. There's a lot of stuff that's happening on here. A lot of interesting stuff, admittedly. I get that. But man, I none of this congeals for me. And I probably have said that in so many words already, but it's really that like the mix of this album is something I can hear three dimensionally. I hear the drums here. I hear the guitar here. I hear the vocals here. I heard the, hear the bass here. And this sort of jazzy proggy element that this album wants to have doesn't work for me when the album is mixed like that. I hear all of the distinct instruments and they sound clear. There's clarity to the recording but they don't intermingle and it leads to me just having, it's a, it's, it's just so, I don't wanna say physically like repellent to listen to, but the sanitized instrumentation here just really doesn't work for me at all. And then Mark's theme comes along and I'm just like, man, if the rest of the album had the texture of this, I would totally be able to get on board with it more. And it's just an interlude and then nothing else sounds like that. And I'm like, wait, what, why? And then it brings me back to the whole Chaos Space Marine thing where it's just like, you know, part of that song has a really satisfying crescendo. And then it just kind of meanders in one part for no reason. And I'm like, why are these songs, like a third of them is cool. A third of them is like whatever. And then a third of them, I just fall asleep to. I'm like, why is, why is every song like this? And the lyricism here, I'll admit in theory, I like it more than I do on the last record because it's patently more emotional, like, and just way more relatable. But there's like, and I hate saying this too because of him leaving the band and it feels like I'm being harsh or whatever, but the lyricism and performances here, it feels like a bit like there's just, there, there's an obscuring try hard nature to making these weird metaphors uh, to, to how you, they the, it makes its points. And it just like, I get the 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 uniqueness of this. I understand like the the how this can translate into appealing to somebody, but it just obscures all of the emotion of this to me, and I'm left adrift in a sea of I don't know how to feel about any of this shit. There's nothing about this that's instrumentally or emotionally intuitive that I feel, which is weird because on the patently less emotional album that they released last year, I thought they did a pretty decent job of that, and. I guess, too, is that, like, there's a lot of the sounds here, a lot of the instruments are just applied in a very tacky kind of way. I, I hate the way the horns sound on this. I'm sorry, but every time they show up, it sounds like a joke. It sounds goofy. And, I, and again, that tonal incongruence just, whoosh, I, I'm just gone. The second half of this album is so Sorry, if I might interrupt very quickly Please. obligatory tinny horns yeah 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 see they don't sound tinny though they don't is everything sounds crystal fucking clear in this and it just leads to feeling so devoid of personality when the album is trying to be overbearing in its personality and like there are parts of this like the end two songs snow globes and basketball shoes which are very long songs that have very very winding structures they, and especially basketball shoes, I'm just, I'm just sitting there waiting for an instrumental idea to grab me and it never comes. I listen to this, I put, put my whole pussy into trying to give this thing everything and emotionally the feedback is nothing. Take something like Bread Song, which is a song I keep seeing on my timeline over and over again, where the metaphor here just feels so clumsy and I get that it's supposed to feel clumsy, but it doesn't change that I'm just sitting here like, okay, particles of bread, decent. 
whatever. And then there's stuff like Haldern where I'm just kind of like, where, where I'm just perplexed as to what this song is trying to accomplish um, like instrumentally. Like there's some great piano tinges on this. And then in the final third of this, it descends into utter fucking tedium. I'm just like, what? And then immediately you get Mark Steen afterwards. And I'm just like, what is fucking happening? And I get it. I sound like an asshole. I sound crotchety. I sound like the fucking Simpsons meme. The fucking, I used to get it, but then they changed what it is. And now I don't like it anymore. And it's, it's just, that when it boils down to the fact is that the singularity of Black Country New Road for me has evaporated since for the first time. And in that is that I get everything other people seem to be getting out of this album from a dozen different albums. There's nothing about this feels unique to me. And I get that it might just because it doesn't come together, but like there are parts where I'm just like, yeah, I too have heard the era of David Bowie that sounds exactly like this. Or I too have heard the Bright Eyes era, which sounds like a lot of these instrumentals combined with the lyricism that feels very, very Connor Oberst. Or I too see the influence of Slint on this. And it's just so exhausting. I wanted, wanted, wanted to give this thing the benefit of the doubt. And it is just, it, it's Jake proof. There's no in for me here. I really like songs like Concord. I think that's a standout song on the track list here. The sound of it does still bug me, but that said, it just sort of goes to show what my problem with the album is as a whole, is that I can get past the way it sounds clearly if the content within is evocative for me. And that just doesn't exist on songs other than uh, the place where he inserted the blade or Concord or even, I guess, Chaos Space Marine, which is probably one of my more enjoyed tracks on the album. And it just, it feels like so much. And seeing this immediately get hit with the wave of hype that Riley has already talked about is just like, I, I just feel like an old fucking man. And I don't like not being on the wavelength of culture. And it, it bothers me profoundly, but uh, uh, I, I just like to start well not start I don't necessarily want to talk right now but I will look I mean if you come for my man's Jake for being crotchety or whatever in the three times that he's had to do that on this podcast and this is the time that you come for him I mean I'm gonna, that, I'm gonna, that, sta- I'm, gonna sta- I'm gonna stab your fucking parents I, like I'll do it <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that, to be honest, was one of the greatest rants in the history of this podcast. That was, Absolutely. That was magnetic. I, 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 I'm going to look at you right now. If any of you do anything to disencourage that, I'm going to kill you. Well, first of all, thank you for all for being supportive. I've been dreading this all week because this is the only album I didn't want to talk about. But I, I knew and on some level from the reactions that you all would understand on some level just because you're understanding people. That said, it's it's just, it's very difficult not to just go against the grain, but to go against the grain in a way where it's like, I can't deny that a lot of my feelings here are wrapped up in a sort of childish envy that, you know, the other people are getting what I'm not getting. But at the same time, there's the music critic side of my brain here that's just like, I just can't help but get past the fact that like, you know, there are people who I 100% believe love this album as much as they say they do people on this podcast for example right now and then there are other people where i'm just like i hate to say this but genuinely it feels like the praise for this album isn't related to this album it feels like whatever the next black country new road album was going to be it would be met with this wave of hype and i feel like that does this record which i don't care for a disservice because you need to unpack and sit like this is not an album that is meant for immediate reactions this is an album that the people who made it they deserve your time to be able to parse through it you could end up loving it just as much as you say you do but you give them as much attention as you're giving to the whole cultural hype wave right now these musicians deserve to be appreciated for what they're doing and i don't like it just it's disheartening to see at least some people where i'm just kind of like 
I, I just mm. don't really believe you're evaluating this album. I believe that you're evaluating the sophomore Black Country New Road album. Well, and I this, get it. I know well, how it sounds. No, but, well, you're right. I mean, this ties into what I, I, this is why I brought that up earlier is that with certain bands and within certain aspects of hype music culture, people project a lot. There's an investment, there's a projection, there's this idea that and we've seen this with Mitski this week actually I would say Mitski's an even better encapsulation of this this week where it's like they can do no wrong and it's this idea that therefore if I don't get something the problem is with me it's not necessarily the problem with the art like I need to just keep going until I get it and I want to say it's more complicated than that because like I believe if you don't get something you should not automatically blame the art necessarily I think no. it's, it's, it's worth really allowing for the possibility that you just need time, but equally, like, you, it, it goes the other way as well. Like, you need to let art sit, and that's where you live in a culture where people don't do that, and I mean, I've talked about this before in terms of streaming and the nature of the way music is, consum- is consumed because of streaming, where there's no investment required to listen to music. You can go from one thing to the next. And that's something I have to be conscious of as someone who's trying to listen to as many new releases as possible this year. I have to be aware of the fact that I am engaging in something that inherently encourages not engaging with music, encourages passive consumption. When you had to buy music to listen to it, that's the opposite of that. It's encouraging active consumption because you're trying to understand. Like you, you I spent get... $14 on this CD, yeah. so I am going to listen to it because I bought it with my own money. Yeah, and so to me, a lot of the most interesting aspects of this album cycle is not, well, I think there's a lot of interesting about the album, but this aspect of how it highlights this fascinating part of our culture, which we'll see again and again and again, uh, is interesting. And I mean, like the inverse of it is like... An, an, analogous to the Mitski is even like the last the most recent Lord album which is a more interesting example because I think a lot of people even fans were quicker to kind of disavow that and then you have people in the Mitski camp who are sort of more um forgiving or like seemingly more invested I think that speaks to the cachet that artists have when they're fresher and newer in the minds of their fans as well like a lot of these Mitski stands have gotten on board in the last couple of years Uh, And Black Country New Road, because they're putting out the second album, not even a year after their first record, that they're in this intensified space within their hype cycle, right? They're so fresh. They're so new. They haven't lost their, they haven't had enough time to be a band to lose their luster for fans. And so there's this frenzied nature around them. And, um, yeah, I mean, I got so caught up in that. I, I want to talk about the songs as well uh, and the, the ideas of the album. Uh, obviously, I don't want this segment to be hours long, so I'll try and condense it a little bit. If you're interested in really, really diving into like every line and every aspect and element of these songs, I highly recommend Professor Sky's video on this album. Uh, I, I did watch that. That, that he's just the Wonder. best music commentator on on YouTube, in my opinion, because he's completely not influenced by peripheral culture. He's just completely approaching albums, and he, he approaches albums wanting to understand everything he reviews. But anyway, he has a great, very thorough breakdown. Uh, so watch that if you want to go really line by line. I will talk about what I think the album's about. Of course, want to hear from Jacob as well, your perspective on the album, but broadly. Another of the reasons why it takes so much time to be really clear about the fact that Isaac leaving the band has influenced the way people have responded to this record and has maybe resulted in some projection is that I ultimately, like Professor Sky, although I I reached this conclusion before I watched this video, I believe this is an album that Isaac wrote about wanting to leave Black Country New Road. Uh, there is a sense of a narrative arc that this album has. And the arc that's presented to you is a failing relationship in which a a person is desperately needing affection and response and at times even to be cared for and looked after by their partner who is essentially giving them this coldness in response, who is not engaging with them emotionally. And across the course of the album, this coldness leads this 
um, protagonist to kind of reflect inwards and retreat inwards and realize that in kind of begging for or wanting to make this relationship work that can't work, he's only hurting himself more and more and more. He's only self-destructing more and more and more until you get this realization within the last stretch of the record that he needs to kind of escape from this in some way, or he'll forever be in the throes of this person who owns him forever. Paging and, Tyler the Creator's Igor. <laughs> fantastic comp. I wouldn't have thought of that, but that's actually a really good comparison. But yeah, Isaac is an incredibly literate writer. What I like about Isaac's literate writing is that while, yes, it's laden with cultural references, they're so broad um, that you don't ever feel like he is writing in this particular two-dimensional style. Like there's songs here that reference uh, Billie Eilish and like the current kind of pop landscape. There's also heavy references to Futurama across this record. There's a reference <laughs> to Warhammer 40K on yeah, Chaos Space yeah. Marine. There are these, all of these, again, to do a BCNR reference, references, references, references. Um, <laughs> Nerd shit. Yeah, and that is an, an important part of the way that Isaac writes. And I think that why that works for me, I think why that's appropriate is that, uh, particularly for this record, is that if you read the relationship dynamic story in this record as being a kind of allegory for the relationship between a musician and artist and fan bases who kind of suck or need so much for you from you or project so much onto you, and the, what, what that does to you internally, I think that the cultural references and the way that they're used as kind of landscaping to kind of uh, color some of the metaphors that he's dropping start to make a little bit more sense. And again, another of the reasons why I really hammered home the cultural landscape and the stan culture and the projection so much is because I think when you read the record through the uh, allegory of you know, fame and its relationship to mental health, then you see how that actual tangible reality has affected Isaac in the same way that it's affected Mitski. I mean, that's why I wanted to talk about Mitski and the what we've been listening to segment, because it's kind of a good preamble for this album here. And so you, what you get is this continuous story that's being told of the damage that this needy relationship does to Isaac. And th there's references to the Concorde airplane, and that's the infamous sort of failure of that airline is used as a metaphor for the relationship. And there's lots of literary references that are, in my opinion, very eloquent and very kind of layered. Uh, there is an extended uh, reference to Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon and snow globes that is a, an incredibly complicated way of communicating a simple idea about faith and about... Um, needing to believe in something as opposed to having enough confidence in yourself to not have to leech onto some external hope, which I think is what that song is about. And you have all of this stuff decorated across the record. And I love that it's this big tapestry treasure chest for people like me who, you can, who can dive into stuff and find references and start to piece together what you think the song's about. But it is a lot. And it highlights that aspect of the record, how dense the songwriting is, highlights again, why it's so important to spend time with a record like this. Not just because you should spend time with a record for a, in general before you form an opinion, but because with an album this dense as well, you have to, you have to really live with it. You have to really start to investigate it yourself as well, not just glob onto, oh, what is this analysis, full analysis of the song and like absorb someone else's opinion about what it's about. A letter seep into you and figure it out for yourself um and if you're really not fucking into it then don't feel like the culture has obligated you to dedicate unreasonable amounts of time to it either it's i mean it's about finding a balance and more important than anything else it's, a, it's about not reacting prematurely it's about like be the antidote to the streaming era. Be the antidote to the reaction era. There's a fucking reason why we don't do reactions on this fucking channel. Like, be the antidote to that. Actually 
stand for and, Im and be emblematic of what you want people to do with music, which is take it seriously, which is treat it with respect. And um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of turned into an extended rant. Be about the change that you want to see in the world. But yeah. <laughs> um, Jacob, uh. Jacob, you haven't had a chance to say very much at this point. Um, I want to hear from more from you about the music itself, about this album, about your experience with it this week, about obviously it means a lot to you. Obviously, it's one of your favorite records of the year. Why? I was not expecting to love this album as much as I did. Again, and I, because y'all bring up some great points. It was 364 days after the last uh, BCNR record. You know, like, again, I was kind of weird, like worried that it would have the same kind of dry humor that, again, like much like Jake, that's what didn't connect with me fully, like why I don't think of it as like a great, great record. I just think it's very good. And yet Isaac Wood's lyr lyrics have only gotten better in that in that time and I think part of it is again part of this is going to be entirely personal when I first heard this record I didn't catch the allegories at first I thought this was a genuinely about a crumbling long distance relationship not to get too personal I've been through that and so hearing yeah. these like very very like dense and these very dense lyrics about this, I was admittedly like, Jesus Christ, God damn, I, I've lived this, this is my hell. And Isaac Wood is like, uh, is singing about this so eloquently and so beautifully. Virtuling your Dante. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Stupidest um, thing I've ever said. <laughs> that's gay. So, I really love the production on this record. I think the fullness and the richness of it all really does make it better, in my opinion. And I love the ideas that are presented here. Now, sure, they may not. Again, these are done by a bunch of young music fans who are kind of pulling from their biggest influences. But to me, that's also why it really works, honestly. It worked for me in a way it didn't on the first record. Uh, because I don't know, they to me they just sound more confident in the studio, and I think the sequencing of the album works brilliantly because every moment on the last few seconds of each track feels like a proper segue into the next track. Like uh, the 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 place where he inserted the blade, those last notes feel like they perfectly go into fucking snow globes, or like you know like uh, the sudden like kind of slow down of chaos space marine perfectly transitions and segues into concord and uh like that to me like the flow of the album is to me what kept it much more engaging than uh for the first time and uh a couple tracks i want to shout out is goodwill hunting Biggest, really, that's really, the biggest grower on the record for me. I was initially oh, oh. not into that, but um, it's just really, I've really come around on it. Uh, I, what I think I compared it to, one comp I made with that song was, it's like uh, if Los Campesinos were fronted by Nick Cave. <laughs> <laughs> one. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. Brain so big again, you like, can't support the weight of your own head. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this song, I don't know, like the sudden distortion that uh, wasn't there on Brad's song in Concord, uh, I thought added a bit of a uh, jolt of energy to that song. Again, I like the lyrics of, again, like, because uh, people were saying, like, well, what does this have to do with Goodwill Hunting? Well, it feels like uh, the end of the film, which is both character, which is that Matt Damon's character is completely uncertain as to where his own future is going to go. And that may as well be Isaac Wood. And again, like these two characters, Minnie Driver and Matt Damon, they are in some sort of an uncertainness of, an, of a long distance relationship. And um, yeah, really, really fucking love that track. But I guess the one, if there's one or two songs, again, or three songs, sorry, <laughs> the last third of this record is my favorite thing I've heard all year so far as like a giant complete whole. I was, I never expected the fucking world's second best Slint tribute act to make me shed some goddamn tears. 
especially with the place where he inserted the blade, which is just like, again, you have those moments of like, okay, show me where he, show me where he hurt you and I can take comfort and I can help you. I can, I will do my best to help you. To me, again, that is just an absolutely beautiful and sweet sentiment that just, I don't know, just, I thought the whole sweetness of that, as well as, again, Isaac sounding like he's in pain when he sings the lyric, um, show me the cadence of the fifth that you want me to play. And then he's like, oh, wait, now he's become this person to all these people about how he's just, about how he's now the savior. And then you have those fucking backing vocals, the ba da das and I don't know, like, I, I don't know, like, it sounds like 60s pop in, in a way, like the zombies or something like that, as well as, again, late era Bright Eyes. And it's just so perfectly done. And then you get those fucking chords that transition to the snow globes, which is my favorite song of the year. Um, I didn't hear this song. I didn't hear any of the singles before going into this record. I wanted everything to be a surprise. I wanted everything to just kind of, you know, be fresh. The song that reminds me most of snow or the song that snow globes reminds me most of is weather report by the Fishmans, which Ooh. that is one of my top five favorite pieces of music that's ever been recorded and part of that is like you have this really small intimate intro where in the Fishman's case it's just synths in snow globes case it's this guitar, and then everything just kind of keeps building. I love the way the fucking horns and the backing vocals, like it just starts with guitars and then you hear that beautiful saxophone and then suddenly those backing vocals come in and the drums come in and it sounds like the, it sounds like Isaac himself is being shaken, like, like, uh, like he is in a snow globe. Like he's comparing his fucking anxiety anxiety to a snow globe and like the the drumming just perfect perfectly complements those lyrics and like the way it kind of just then goes back to that simple uh those simple chords and the way it just plays out is just really really beautiful to me i'm almost tearing up thinking about that song it ends on this 12 minute opus and it really does sound like the perfect goodbye to me, especially with those final chords and Isaac just singing like these are the last notes that he'll ever sing. And um, the, like everybody just clapping and cheering like, uh, like it is a perfect farewell to him. And like this small legacy that he has left behind. And honestly, like I think this album did make me a believer in Black Country New Road. I think that they are going to do great things, especially with, you know, these instrumentalists who I, again, like I always thought they were the strongest parts of this band because, I don't know, I just always found them very creative and mm. saxophonist, especially, and the drummer. But yeah, yeah well, that's, the, dr uh, the, the drummer, Tyler Hyde, uh, is I think the front runner to be the new leader of the band. And she is she, her her work is is excellent. She's always been like one of the biggest assets of the band, in my opinion. It takes a very good drummer to do what she does on Snow Globes and make it sound purposeful, as opposed to just just cacophonous. Uh, and obviously, it might not sound per it might not work for everyone, but um, she's she sounds like she's playing in a centrifuge on that song. It's it's just nutty, but yeah. So uh, I I want to I want to mention something that when we first reviewed uh, for the first time, I had not yet familiarized myself with Slint's Spiderland. In the interim, I had, as you can see in our video on the subject, uh, and it's since rocketed into my I don't know, 30, 35 favorite albums of all time. And... A lot <sighs> I know it's like a like a bit at this point. But the people who are discovering this band right now, as a lot of people are and will be, th th if they hear of that bit initially, I think they're going to be quite confused. 
like what it reminds me of if if i want to be really mean the first thing it reminded me of was when people were saying that Coldplay sounded like radiohead and i'm not going to say that <laughs> i'm going to imply it but i <laughs> what it reminds me of more is when uh everybody was saying that silver sun pickups were like the second coming of smashing pumpkins which and i think that's a more accurate comparison anyway which i no what well, it, it, it dude has a high pitched voice so suddenly oh it's so billy corker this bass sounds like smashing pumpkins i'm a fucking idiot uh <sighs> Like, just can we separate these things once and for all? Because Black Country New Road, in terms of the albums that they have released and the thing and the material that I am familiar with, bear about as much resemblance to Slint as like recent Mogwai albums do, which is sh- sure if you squint your ears so that psa is out of the way this is this album is like fine it's fine it's it, I, like i could i could put my review very succinctly and just repeat my review uh, uh my letterbox review of the marvel film eternals uh which reads <laughs> oh, no. oh. which reads it's fine unspeakably long but it's fine <laughs> you know seconded L- live, your, live your truth king i will note that i definitely co-sign the idea that the lyrics are far and away more compelling than on the on uh, on the debut record and you know the the soundscapes are expanded upon I don't necessarily think that they are improved in any measure, but I have to mention again how much sequencing matters because the the fact that, and this is a, a very negative hill that I will die on in this instance, the, the last two songs being put consecutively like they are when they are like uh, like 10 and a half and 12 and a half minutes or something uh respectively is a mistake maybe not for the yes. arc of the album but like part of this is my reaction to the album because by that point of the record i'm just kind of fatigued and ready to be done with the experience and a 10 and a half and then 12 and a half minute closer does not help that. You know what could have helped that is putting one of those at least uh, like one or two songs earlier on the track list. And this is this is a I saw uh, Riley re- either retweet or like an Ian Cohen tweet that was like, this is the fewer afraid and or the infinite Josh and the fewer afraid of 2022. And once I got over the fact that that made me want to kill myself, um, <laughs> I I'm so glad like, you said it so I didn't have to. I I was like, you know, if you're not on board with illusory walls by the time that those two songs come on, you you might you might off yourself, and fair enough. But I was not on board with the album when these two songs hit. So, you know, they aren't my favorites to elaborate a little bit. I do, I do think it sounds pretty good. I think the mixing's pretty nice. Uh, I mean, these are obvious, as it was evident on for the first time, this is a very talented group of musicians interested in doing things that are, you know, not original or, or cutting edge, but at the very least interesting in some way um even if that interesting measure completely misses the mark for me a couple times 
I really like uh, Chaos Space Marine and Concord and uh, the place where he inserted the blade is Ivan going to mirror that that's the best thing here. Uh, not even by a lot, I would say, but I would say it is the best thing here for me. So this is certainly not an album without its merits, but you know, if like you're just if you're not on board, you're not this isn't going to change your mind. Um, and I think that is a perspective that is definitely worth noting in the sea of music Twitter and rate your music like tsunami of praise that is being thrown at this album is that I I do not think it would be helpful in any way to approach this album like I didn't fall in love with for the first time but this is going to be the sophomore effort that absolutely knocks my socks off for this band it might be I don't know your life but you know just don't put too much stock in a sudden 4.15 on rate your music for 4.12 whatever numbers it don't put too much stock in that because the album's been out for a week uh, and this was like built in, bolted to this album hype. So it's, it's easy to get caught up in all that. And, you know, if you're not feeling it, you got somebody who's in that stratosphere with you. To be fair, though, that thing about the, the full point, I mean, you could also say that about To Pimp a Butterfly, but I, I take your point. Um, Except that that album's been out for like five years. No, but I mean, like, when it came out, you could have said the same thing about it. Um, but it, your, your point stands. Well, well, it, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I'm, sure, I'm sure people who really love this record, like, I mean, 10 out of 10 it, feel the same as people who did that with To Pimp a Butterfly the day that it came out. I, I, what I'm saying is I think you shouldn't take too much stock in the score in terms of like, oh, I'm going to love this. Uh, I agree with that. But also like, it, it's not worthless either. Like it's a good cultural indicator. One thing we've maybe been a little bit too harsh on is just saying, well, all of this hype is just because people want to like it. And there's definitely a, 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 an element of that. But I, I just don't want it to go too far into the weeds of saying like, well, you know, none of this should be taken seriously because of hype culture. It, it's it's somewhere between those extremes. That's why okay. I talk about so, this is so fucking difficult is because there exists no absolutes in this discussion. None. You have to cover your ass for everything you say about this. Positive, negative, whatever. It just makes this shit hard. And I... I will double down on my point and say that I'm not advising you to ignore the significance of a 4.12. I am advising you to take into consideration the fact that the amount of hype that this ha band has in certain circles is excessive in, like, objectively, and approaching that with anything other than that wave of hype is difficult. And you might want to prepare yourself for that in some way if you were intent on approaching this album in yeah. that regard. Yeah, no, I, I co-sign, absolutely. Um, I was more just kind of like adding a caveat to my own emphasis on how much hype has influenced this album's reception. The, the real problem for this is that, you know, we're like a, a burgeoning music podcast. We have somewhat of a following now and people some for some reason take stock in our opinions so you want to be on the same level as everyone else culturally and that doesn't amount to loving everything that everyone loves it amounts to understanding it yeah. and it's not that i don't understand the album it's that i don't understand the reaction to the album and i want to put this forth just so anyone watching this isn't like 100% crystal clear on how I think all this works and all of my frustration is that my frustration does not lie with the people who love this. It, it doesn't. And that's, that's the most difficult part of articulating my opinion is that a lot of the people who are really, really going to latch onto this and watch this episode and 
you know, a lot of them want to be reaffirmed with the opinions that they already hold. And I'm that way with lots of albums that I love too. I understand that, you know, when certain very big music critics uh, give certain albums, certain particularly high scores, it leads to the discussion around art being very, very thorny. And my, my thesis here is really that it's just like, I don't want to be mean to the people who love it. I don't want to be mean to Isaac. I don't want to be mean to the band because I wish everyone, all included, all the best. I love that people are enjoying an album. I couldn't give less of a shit if it's an album I like or not. It's good to enjoy music. It's good to enjoy music from grassroots artists like this. And you know what? If you love it, keep on loving it. Give it that fucking high score that you know that it deserves. However, <laughs> also just take a step back realize that this is a specific thing when you take a when you take a moment to step outside this cultural bubble this is going to be alien to some fucking people my jo most. job here is not most, most my job people. here is not to take away your fun and to listen to this and get you riled up and rowdy because you disagree with me it's just to voice my opinion i have no quarrel with anybody and I hope Isaac gets much better. I hope that the band are able to continue on successfully without him, just because that's not something that, especially younger musicians like this, I hope they have a long and fruitful career and they've made music that I like. So this isn't something where I'm just like, I just hate the windmill scene. I just hate black. Crack. No, it's just hard. That's all. And there's a lot of it too. Like we're in a moment where this is happening and the scene is exploding and you're getting a lot of bands. And that means you, are, as people who run a music podcast, we are frequently having to discuss the scene, which means we're all frequently having to try and understand the scene. And the review of the album inherently becomes a review of the scene when it's this popular. That's what has to happen. Yeah, I also think that, to be honest, some people who are watching might disagree. But I think our discussion about music culture with regard to this album has been more interesting and maybe informative than like breaking down the songs. Um, that's you probably listen to the songs enough to know what's good well, or great there, about them. There's a place for that too, but also like there's yeah. people, as I said before, there's people who've done that better than we have the time to do. And I think that uh, just to me anyway, it's more interesting to discuss the psychology and sociology of music uh, in some instances anyway, like with popular music, than to just like, oh, dissect every little detail of the songwriting. I, I like to try and do both, but I like that we've had a discussion about music culture, because I think that makes our review a bit different. I, I like to say just one thing real quick. I like, as somebody who is a huge fan of this record, who, is, who may be like, like uh, who I don't ever want my opinion to seem like, okay, I'm just getting on the hype train just because no. I do genuinely, absolutely love this album. And I hope not to like, I mean, cause I do think in 12 months, maybe the discussion around this record will be a little more grounded. Like once the like initial, like 10 out of 10 hype kind of dies down and everybody's putting together their best of the year list. I, th I do mm -hmm. think the discussion is absolutely going to be more grounded. I guess I just wanted to come at this as somebody who was, you know, did enjoy that first record, but found this to be a step in the right direction. And you, you feel the strongest. I think that's only natural. I mean, you want to speak for that perspective. And if we didn't include that perspective, I think that would be lacking on our part, frankly, if we're going to go out of our way to have different uh, points of view, especially. I mean, we're, we're going to get music projects later in the year. I mean, like supposedly we're going to get a new Kendrick album. That's absolutely going to ha like the exact same thing is going to happen no matter oh, yeah. what. Mm. Oh, without a doubt. All right. Let's rate this bad boy. Jake, why don't you kick us off? All right, fucking to take your medicine before you get to eat your sweet treat, I guess. Uh, three favorite tracks. Uh, easily place where he inserted the blade. Uh, second place, Concord. Third place, uh, Chaos Space Marine. Um, least favorite track is... Uh, I'm not going to say Mark's theme, just because that's really more of a structural grievance I have. I'll say Haldern. Doesn't really do much for me. Kind of irritates me. Uh, and this is a it's, a it's a four out of ten. All right, six. Morgan. Anyway. 
uh, my three favorites are. Sorry, uh, you just like, kind of sounded like Patty and Selma from fucking Simpsons. My <laughs> three favorites. Uh, <laughs> place where he inserted the blade. Spoiler alert, it's his butt. Uh, Chaos Space Marine and Bread Song. Least favorite is snow globes uh, and i will give this a five and a half out of ten all righty my three favorite songs are the place where you inserted the blade concord and basketball shoes uh, my least favorite song on the record is probably mark's theme um and i am going to give the album an eight out of ten Three favorite tracks for me were uh, Snow Globes and First Police. Second is The Place Where You Inserted the Blade. And third is Basketball Shoes. Least favorite was Haltern. And this is getting a nine out of 10 for me. Wonderful. That is an ominous average of 6.6 .6 out of 10 for Black Country New Roads, Ants From Up There. Jacob, thank you for joining us yet again. It's been a pleasure to have you back on the podcast. Viewers at home, make sure you stick around for our record club on Tuesday, where Jacob will be returning to discuss the Velvet Underground's White Light, White Heat. Jacob, thanks again, and we look forward to having you again soon. Thank you for having me. Okay, now it's time to review our third album of the day, which is... The new Rolo Tomasi album, Where Myth Becomes Memory. And for the first time in a long time, in fact, there's a couple of reasons why this is the first time or for a long time. We First of all, we have five people here to review this new Rolo Tomasi album. Yeah. And notably, we have the long-awaited, and by long-awaited, I mean one month, return of August who is back to review this album alongside us. And so who would like to jump in with some background knowledge on who Rolo Tomasi are? Because this is a band whose, spoiler alert, style has evolved over the years. Uh, but who would like to talk about who Rolo Tomasi are and why we're reviewing this new album? Rolo Tomasi are a band from Nottingham, Nottinghamshire in the United Kingdom, most often described as a math core band, but their sound has shifted over the years into post hardcore, metal core, post metal, some dream pop shit on the last. I don't know. The point is, this band is very much in a constantly ever changing, ever shifting soundscape and where myth becomes memory is their first album since a sort of watershed breakout moment for them their 2018 release time will die and love will bury it which is what the fuck are you laughing at now i'm sorry i just looked over at my phone and i saw a twitter dm from rhiannon that said what the fuck is math core just one of those days <laughs> Math core is when you're really into calculus class. We very literally do not have the time for me to explain that. So time will die and love will bury it. it was a sort of moment for the band where so many of the things that they had been working towards came together finally and but also where they introduced a lot of new avenues in their own sound um and maybe the thing that was most impressive about that record is the way that all of these things came together to make something surprisingly cohesive and such a giant leap for the band at the same time uh, if you haven't heard that album i would describe it as essential listening for extreme music in the 2010s yeah. And that leaves us at their 2022 release, Where Myth Becomes Memory, which is uh, it's, uh, it's an album. It is 
Time Will Die and Love Will Bury It too, in a, in a lot of ways. Like, it's not quite as good as that album, and it does, like, do certain things that album doesn't do. Um, but to me, now, context here, I haven't listened to any records prior to Time Will Die and Love Will Bury It. My understanding is this is a band that have evolved, maybe not with every record, but pretty consistently. But my kind of grievance, I guess, if there was to be one, although I have a couple, is that this very much, I think, lit, and I don't want to be unfair to it because there's a lot of really good songs on this album, but I feel like it's going to exist under the shadow of that previous record to a certain extent because it does a lot of what that record does and it has less of the all-timer sort of songs that that record does have. That aside, because again, it's not necessarily fair to view the record through the lens of its predecessor, but to me, that was a big thing that affected me. That said, this album, if you do enjoy the aesthetics of Time Will Die and Love Will Bury It, if you enjoy this kind of heavy, hardcore music that has like a kind of a dreamy aesthetic baked into it, a mixture of growled sort of screamed vocals and these gorgeous clean vocals as well, then you will enjoy this record to a certain extent. Connor, I want to leap to you first, because I know you're kind of one of the other people who's big into this band, and I know you've kind of heard some of their earlier material as well, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. What's your <clears throat> statement or status on uh, where this band are at now and how this record exists kind of in context of their discography? Yeah, well, um, what's interesting is I actually, um, just today, have listened to an album that wasn't this or time will die uh which was grievances and i think if i could be mistaken because i'm not familiar with their early catalog i've heard a few songs from that and it sounded very interesting i think the debut was hysterics is what it's called which is just from the few tracks that i've heard from that it's a lot more chaotic uh, and really like uninviting compared to this with uh, genre influences according to rate your music such as noise core nintendo core and sass core uh what so in the if... goddamn hell is sass core i, w- I was gonna say uh, sass core is actually kind of cool it's, so uh, um... uh, looking at it here it's a sort of subgenre within this hardcore community that uh sort of got started as a response to the overbearing masculinity of hard, just the hardcore scene in general it sounds wildly sexist it <laughs> um, does just yes. as a name uh so that's a little alarming uh but i i mean i can't pass judgment on the scene in any way there's a lot of I great would've... genres that have terrible genre names Yes. most of yeah. them really i mean if it if if it ends in core there's a l- likely chance that it's bad unless it's like hardcore because you know that's we, where we did from, have like but... a 10 minute long rant about gent about a little bit ago so yeah yeah, that, yeah. That's um yeah. yeah i also think like with regard to sass core with regard to like i don't oh, want to like say metal core i, I don't want to say like um that <laughs> I don't because I don't know, have a huge education on SAS core, but I'm aware of it and I'm aware of like what this band are in relation to the bands they're influenced by, like the presence, the presence of the female vocalist, the greater you know dynamics between loud and soft. There's some really just genuinely pretty and not metal at all moments on both this and the previous album as well that really distinguish yeah. it. I will mention there is a group they do, I think, bear a little resemblance to not a ton but definitely a notable amount uh that being last year's uh spirit box who kind of yes. big mm. big metal group last year female vocalist this kind of fusion of these very disparate genres uh mm-hmm. so they're definitely coming from a a kind of precedent within this a, a kind of I, I, maybe you could even say a, a new wave of kind of female fronted hardcore bands uh, i guess we'd have to see where it goes over the next mm. couple of years to make a definitive statement on that well what's interesting about it though is rollo Tomasi have been around for ages but they only seem to have really picked up steam with their last record that, that seems to be the mm. point 
because it has exponentially more ratings mm -hmm. online than their previous record. So that seems to be the moment where they clicked. So maybe that is a cultural thing. Again, I'm not educated enough to necessarily speak to that. But that aspect aside, this music, like the last record, and I think this record as well, are would, would serve as great ways of introducing people who aren't necessarily comfortable with a lot of heavier sort of hardcore music into that world because it eases you in gently, but also at times, because I don't want to sound like I am giving a backhanded compliment, because I'm not, at times as well, this shit is still hard as hell. My favorite mm -hmm. track on this album is Drip. Hell which, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which yep. is this kind of centerpiece to the record. In fact, I would say um, like the best part of this whole record is the kind of three track run in the middle of Closer, Drip, and Prescience. Um, where mm, I would I, agree where I think you get the best display of what Rolo Tomasi do so well, what makes them such an attention grabbing band. And yes, I could see why if you weren't really into this kind of thing and you were a little bit more cynical than we are, you could lump them in with a lot of like quote unquote hipster metal bands or like quote unquote band, which, you know, we are obviously not of that, that kind of metal music listener, but I could see why people might be put off by Rolo Tomasi. But it should be clear that for us, a lot of the things that might put those people off are what make Rollo Tomasi so interesting and so exciting and so beautiful as well. They're not necessarily reinventing the wheel, particularly on this album. But if you want to experience a metal record that frequently just bathes you in bliss, then mm. you could do a lot worse than an album like this. Yeah, and I think this album at least in comparison from what I've heard from their earlier stuff, it's a lot more inviting along with Time Will Die and Love Will Bury It. And I think that's the reason why that album kind of broke out and got some popularity because it seems to be riding this wave that was kind of not necessarily started, but was almost spearheaded by Death Heaven's Sunbather. Yeah. Or that yeah. album just, that album, like when that album dropped, if you remember... What it, like if you remember like the aftermath and no pun intended that like introduced so many people to a whole world of metal and people who normally would not listen to metal at all but let alone extreme metal such as black metal they heard sunbather and they're like wow i'm really digging this and i think rollo tomasi kind of currently represents a continuation of that Although they tend to, of course, take the more metalcore, mathcore route than Death yeah. Heaven does, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I think other bands like Loathe are also on that wave. So yeah. I think there's yeah. this rising interest of like more atmospheric and blissful metal, which, um, like you mentioned, the term hipster metal, which is kind of a derogatory term that, uh, that like traditional metalheads use who think metal should just be evil and dissonant and whatever but yeah i just it is thought it's not a genre <laughs> yes <laughs> fake news not. no um you're right there are certain like bands and records that are associated with that label being used in a derogatory fashion um i think the the big thread between death heaven and loathe and this band in particular is the influence of post-rock specifically yeah, into yeah. the bands and, and music because whether or not you know whether or not you're existing in the same lane of metal in terms of like you know what aspect of black metal you're you're leaning into or what aspect of post-hardcore you're leaning into or what aspect of math rock you're leaning into what makes Rollo Tomasi so exciting and also indicative of their time is the role that post-rock and and blissful sort of soundscapes and builds and you know instrumentation like pianos and things like that that's the sort of defining feature and that can be as well it can be both the gift and it can be the curse because it can be the thing that makes them so gorgeous and enveloping to listen to and it can also be the thing that makes them a little bit bog standard if they're not really on 10 with the with the particular album that they're doing and there are moments on this album where I do feel that the band are spinning their wheels a little bit or not delivering the kinds of compositions that I would come to expect from them from that last record. My biggest grievance with the album, though, has nothing to do with that. 
Um, and it's not actually that big of a grievance because it doesn't like ruin my experience with the record or not. But does anyone else feel like the sequencing on this album is really weird? There's a lot of moments where a song will end and another song will start and it feels so off like um, it, and jarring. I, I won't say I, I a lot, but that. I definitely did feel it once or twice. But there are a couple I, of mo- there are a couple of moments where it's here. where they there is a great transition. Like I think it's from drip into prescience. Maybe has a really nice transition. But there's so many other moments for me on the history album where I'm like, okay, what is trying to be conveyed by the juxtaposition of this song with this one in terms of the flow of the album? And I just come up confused. Again, it doesn't make me dislike the album. It just makes it a really disjointed listening experience. August, what were you going to say? I was thinking about that criticism because you had sent it earlier in the group chat. And I, while I see it, I think it's more to do with the construction of the individual songs themselves rather than the sequencing because, and this is especially apparent in I think the, that first leg of the album yeah, where we'll have a song that goes that has a lot of really heavy, heavy riffage, like uh, cloaked or mutual ruin, but it, the band seems a little unable to sustain those songs' respective runtimes, and so they kind of fizzle out into something a lot less dramatic and impactful than where they started. So you've got this weird kind of pair of dipoles within this song that the song kind of slowly skews across and the experience by the end of the song is so radically different from the one at the start that by the time of the next song where we're going back to that front of that emotional experience it it can feel jarring just because I think the individual songs are, are a bit I guess, just not fully formed in a couple places, or, or they don't have as as strong of an ending idea as they have an opening idea. So that's at least my theory to why that kind of jarring quality can exist within the record. I would just co-sign that. It took me a while to understand, because Riley tweeted, uh, admit it's pretty funny, uh, yeah. thing where it's like Rolo Tomasi writing their new album be like and it's the shuffle button it, it took me a while to understand where you were even coming from because I think the first three tracks and like the three track run of closer into drip and impression I think those are really well sequenced and then they're just part of this album that really do not feel like they had a whole lot of thought put into them and I think it really is just down to the the fact that the uh, the structures of these songs are not as refined or tight as they were on Time Will Die it leads to the album feeling uneven sonically even if my at least in my opinion it is pretty uniform in terms of how much I like it all yeah, I think that's certainly true. Uh, I, I I wish I'd written down the exact transitions that I thought of. I think one of them might have been mutual ruin into labyrinthine, and another one might have been yeah. stumbling yeah, and in, stumbling one. into to resist forgetting as well. But they were just yeah. So th- that that's one thing that kind of le- makes made it difficult for me to get into the album because I listened to this like three or four times before like really trying to settle down and, and dig into it just to kind of take it all in and it was a very bewildering experience but the other thing I almost now look I love Time Will Die and Love Will Bury It I, I that's one of the best records uh, uh new records I've listened to in the last week I almost wish I hadn't listened to it um before <laughs> before reviewing this because there were so many moments while listening to it this where I was like oh I see they're doing what they did on that album again and it's just not quite as good like almost always as a as a really beautiful opening track i i absolutely love the sound of it i love the way it eases you into this album so beautifully but it's not towards dawn <laughs> like that yeah that, um and look there's other tracks I, I love here too like the second track cloaked i think is uh really really strong as well it has some real nice heft to certain parts of it as well 
but then I'm thinking about how towards dawn went into aftermath and I'm just like damn that was that was so good and yeah and like for me it's like who's had that album in rotation since it's since it came out it's like damn aftermath is really just one of the best songs of the last 10 years full stop yeah this is a that math core band made a church's song cool yeah. another thing i loved about time will die as well is that you had these really punchy songs that integrated these different aspects of the sound really well but you also had these really expansive longer tracks on that album hollow hour flood of light contra temp um or contra tom uh you had those songs and Gesundheit they were like the highlights of the record. They were the moments that really shined and really showed how this band's songwriting could really blossom when space is given to it. And you don't really have, like the songs that are long here, um, by and large, with the exception, I guess, of Drip, are kind of some of the least inviting or like least dense and interesting and like detailed songs here. Uh, I will admit as well, the closing track, the last two tracks don't really leave much of an impression on me, which is, very much a shame because the it really matters how you end an album like this um and also like a flood of light is just one of the best songs the genre has ever produced and i i and i i see where i'm going i see i'm going to the into this thing of like it's not the last record it's not as good as the last record and that's really unfair but if you're going to do something that fits so in line with that previous record then you have to kind of address that. And I just don't, I don't feel the record gets there the whole time. I, I like Closer. I really love Drip and I actually love Prescience too, but it feels like a scatter shot mixed bag of, of the band trying to do what they do best, but also kind of like lost for a vision of where to take the sound next. It, it feels like the definition of a spinning your wheels album um, which is to say it's not bad because this band is a good band and they're very talented and they play their music well but it is an album where I'm kind of lost for words on what to really say about it beyond that uh, well I mean I guess I'll be the lone dissenter here uh, no this album is not as good as Time Will Die and Love Will Bury It but then again 95% of most records aren't that good so I but I, I get the complaint that it's not really doing anything new that said Rolo Tomasi you're such a singular presence at this point that spinning your wheels is fine if the wheels are good and the wheels are good they're they're very good in fact they're really um, good that sure um good ass wheel. See, August actually <laughs> made it. Riley will die and I will bury him I want to build off of what August's point was, is that I agree with him about the structure of these songs. And the thing is, is that this is probably just has to do with the fact that I've been listening to the Time Will Die ever since it came out because Morgan was like, yo, this song Aftermath fucking fucks. And then I listened to Aftermath and I was like, yo, this is great. And then he was like, okay, cool. Listen to this album, but nothing else on there sounds anything fucking like this. And I'm like... Well, that sounds ominous. Okay. And then I listened to the rest of it and I was like, oh, God damn, he was right. But the thing is, is that, I mean, I hate to sound like I'm trying, like giving this band a pass or something, but it's like when you're working with such an idiosyncratic sound, I just don't really care if you're not particularly like original in your iterations. The song structures here definitely do start off more compelling in like a, like a riff sense and like the it, it basically in its very straightforward abject heavy moments but the way they sort of spiral outwards and in, in a different place is that I listen to this album like I would like the, the influence of shoegaze on this band is really really strong uh like when you compare it to black gaze that's totally on point but it's way closer to shoegaze than it is black metal and when you have something like that I'm enjoying the atmosphere of the track. I'm enjoying the absolute, like the, these layers of production and sound and studio work are so fucking, they're, they're enticing. They feel like a treat. This is something that's so 
finely tuned that I can get lost in that it just like, again, it's that blissfulness. I don't think that the Devin, Death Heaven comparison is all that far off because I would enjoy an album like Infinite Granite the same way I would something like this. It does have harder hitting moments, but it's kind of like a, it's like breaking the shell so that it can reveal the, the yolk within the egg of, so to speak. This is something that feels like structurally it's designed to blossom uh, in a way that Time Will Die songs didn't really do. Those are songs that like, that's a album that feels very progressive in its song structures, which is why it's more immediate and why it's more uh, easy to like latch onto and understand is that you kind of like the, the winding passages that that goes through are like, they're really obviously impressive and they're really, really dense too. But the spacier kind of vibe of this, it's admittedly a lot more straightforward. This is a lot more like the hard hitting moments are way more metal core than they are math core, which is fine by me if you make up for it in the density of your sound. I agree with Morgan in the respect that like my issue with the album is actually Riley's issue in that I don't think it blows together very well. And the problem being is that I think you could easily get around that with the way these songs are structured. This should probably be an album that fits together a little bit better. That said, the singular songs on here are good enough to the point where it's like, I mean, yeah, but like, I don't care. Like I, I, every single thing here just really fucking goes. And I, I, it sucks too, because it's just like, yeah, it probably is going to live in the shadow of the previous record. And in many ways, it would have been so much more advantageous if they released this and then Time Will Die, because it feels like that's the way you would go linearly, like as a band with your sound and what you're like doing with it is this is a more primal kind of bass album. But as such, it does have an appeal that Time Will Die does not for me. Like when I have to listen to that album, I have to sit down and pay that album a lot of fucking attention because it's doing a lot. Here, on the other hand, it's a lot more of a, you know, it's not a passive experience, but it's an experience that I feel is easy to find yourself lost within in a way that you can't find yourself lost within other albums. Like this, I probably say that I enjoy this album for a lot of the same reasons that Riley and Morgan enjoyed the last Death Heaven album so much, is that this album to me is denser and more cohesive and more hard hitting and that's just what I like about it. I, it's just an experience that has really, really appealed to me. It's not perfect and it's not exactly something new, but at the same time, when you're Rolo Tomasi, I, I, fucking, you can do whatever the fuck you want as long as you have all of these components working with your sound because nobody else in the fucking business sounds anything like you when you put all of these things together. So yeah, yeah, you know, I'm not picking to save it over time will die or, or anything if my house is on fire, but this is still easily, in my opinion, the band's second strongest effort so far. There is something to be said for the for the appeal of like the sonic whiplash that this album does. Like it really makes it clear. We mm -hmm. are we are um Brodo Tomasi and we do all of these different sounds like you have moments in this record where you're just moving so quickly from one thing to a completely different thing and that experience didn't quite connect for me here but I can definitely see the appeal of that there are other albums that I like a lot that do that kind of thing um, so in a certain sense, it's not the worst possible introduction into this band either it seems to be that they are making a series of records that are I guess showcasing how they have changed since their early kind of like math core days. I think a lot of people who have been familiar with Rollo Tomasi since they kind of started out, think of them as the math core band that went like post metal. And maybe a lot of people miss that. I'm curious to check it out. I'm curious to check out that era when they were really leaning fully into that. Maybe that'll appeal to me even more. Or maybe I'll just miss the gorgeous, rich, atmospherics of these last two records but i, I get grievances probably riley that's an album that i think would be up your alley at least a little bit if you like this or that album or like if you even like this even a little bit my advice is just like literally just go listen to time will die and level bury it because mm -hmm. while i really really dig this album i think it is empirically less good than the thing that came uh the, the thing that preceded it like it's it, it is just better which reductive but it's true no i'm i was unfamiliar with uh 
I think I'm the only person who was unfamiliar with that album going into this. And uh, and maybe that's this unfamiliarity, which leads me to, to feeling this way. But I, I certainly like the point you bring up, Jake, about this being like the fun of this band is kind of just how unique they are with their synthesis of genres. I, I guess my thing is I don't find their uh, synthesis consistently works for me. I think there are some points where it breaks down a little to the point where they can feel like a little narrow-minded in their focus by taking so many ideas and cramming them into one thing. It can just sound like one thing. And uh, that's that, that's maybe a weird thing to say, but I, I do think there are I do find the moments that I like best on here are are when they they feel like they're going for that juxtaposition and really highlighting that like I think uh, like almost always I think is a fun opener that like just heavy harsh kind of twinkly static is cool uh, mm-hmm. cloaked I thought had that that kind of harsher heavier drum sound with the I, I guess twinkly is really the best element because. Uh, descriptor I'd use for that element of it because it's yeah kind of dream poppy kind of shoegazy I I definitely uh, like this just struck me as something Jake would enjoy and and Closer also had this kind of weird weirdly kind of poppy and and up-tempo flavor to it which I thought was a nice nice little thing to bring in but a lot of the rest of it can feel a little haphazard in my opinion overall though I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was too bad. And that's kind of part of the reason I wanted to talk about it, just because I thought it did, uh, it it filled in a niche for me that I I didn't know needed filling. One thing I noticed about this record, and I know we've kind of been talking about how it's kind of a continuation of what they've been doing on Time Will Die, which it is, definitely. One thing that I kind of picked up on is that this album reminds me more of like a lot of the classic post metal and even even to an extent atmospheric sludge stuff like just just the cover and the name kind of sounds like it's almost like a isis band name or band generator or whatever like yeah it's like i would see this and think it was an isis record or something Um, they have a record called in the absence of truth which is not a million miles away from where myth becomes memory Oh yeah, Where the monkey meets the man. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna find a way to bring that album up every time Connor's on here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What one thing I did take note of that's different about this record than the last one is that I think that I feel like the guitars are way more down tuned on this album. Like they sound a yeah. lot heavier than they did mm-hmm. on Time Will Die. Like especially on a track like Labyrinthine, Labyrinth. Labyrinthine. I say like I that. say Labyrinthine, but Labyrinthine, yeah. It's definitely not one of my highlights, but that like just groovy, huge riff, yeah. That that is something that I feel like I haven't really heard from them previously. Mm. And then there are some little more subtle additions like. There's a lot of great like synth and keyboard sounds on this record, especially a song like uh, near the, I think near the end of Drip has a really cool um, like synth arpeggi- arpeggiator or whatever. And one thing I will say, I also really love I love the bookends of this album, the opening and the closing. I love the way it starts. And I it was something I only noticed today while listening to the record is that it starts the same way it ends, like. Mm-hmm transatlanticism style which i thought was kind of <laughs> neat but yeah overall i'm pretty much with jake on this uh it may not be the most original and like it's not it's clearly not quite as like shockingly amazing Rish. as time will die yeah, yeah i agree um, that um yeah. this album kind of peaks with uh closer and drip because those are two songs that are like the absolute like that's like the dichotomy of Rolo Tomasi is like 
the mm-hmm. super soft, beautiful track that does kind of mm-hmm. remind me of like the softer moments on A Flood of Light or Aftermath. And mm-hmm. then you got Drip, which is just Drip just Game, that, it, Drip Game 100. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Well done, everybody. Well, yeah, I'll, I will. I will just say before we wrap up that um, uh, for me, this is the first properly great album of the year. You could do the Morgan Lakes the Metalcore album. Who is that down to? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that was that was <laughs> the way you crossed your eyes. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. <laughs> You turned into like an animated character. That was fantastic. Oh my god. <laughs> August is like they really just fell apart without me. God damn. I'm so, yeah, really. I'm so, no. I'm, so, I'm so tired. Yeah, I definitely agree that this is not as tight or cohesive as Time Will Die. What I think it is is more expansive and sort of I don't want to say adventurous, but more willing to let certain things that they explore breathe in ways that I find really interesting. Uh, but it, it, it also, again, is so singular to Rolo Tomasi as a band that, you know, I'm not going to hold too much against it for not succeeding Time Will Die as the next biggest thing in hardcore it is simply enough for me anyway for it to be just a really damn good album hell yeah mm-hmm. it's the it's a rare instance of an, a band that we wanted to shout out because they're kind of underrated and underheard where the album that we're talking about is actually a great entry point if you haven't heard them before because if you get yeah, I, I would i would actually I, I would say ideal yeah i mean if you point. like like any of this boy we have the album for you and then thus you'll be a fan of the band yeah so this Yay. is the yeah all right favorite tracks and ratings then jake why don't you leave this off sure uh my three favorite tracks are probably uh cloaked prescience and I want to stand up for the last two songs actually i i i really really like uh especially the end of eternity i'm gonna say that one uh shout out to still drip and, and closer they're all they're all they're good they're great songs and i give the album a, a hearty eight out of ten uh i don't really have a least favorite song because nothing on here is it's i, I don't have one august all right, uh, my three favorite tracks would be Almost Always, uh, Closer, and Drip. A least favorite would, uh, I, I might say, Labyrinthine. I would give it a 6 out of 10. Pillow! It's yeah. back! Yeah. Reading Pillow Ooh. Returns. Uh, my three favorite tracks are Mutual Ruin. I adore that song. I'll, I'll also say almost always. And uh, uh, what, 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 what else? My brain just skipped like a record there. <laughs> um, I saw it happen. I, uh, 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 oh, uh, this boy sounded like a Mad Lib beat. Whatever. It's drip. Least favorite, I will probably say stumbling, and I will give this an eight and a half out of ten. All right, my three favorite tracks are Closer Drip and Prescience. My least favorite track is Stumbling. I'm giving the album a six out of ten. Connor, my three favorites are Drip, Closer, and The End of Eternity. My least favorite is Stumbling, and I'm giving this an eight. All right, that is an average of 7.3 for Rolo Tomasi's Where Myth Becomes Memory. Let us know at home what you think of the Rolo Tomasi album. Let us know at home what you think of any of the albums that we have discussed today on the podcast. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your takes in the comments below. If you enjoy what we do and you're listening on a streaming platform, please give us a five-star rate and review. It really helps us out. If you're watching on YouTube, 
please like the video and subscribe if you have not already. If you enjoyed the video, of course, uh, those things both help us out a shitload. So please consider doing that. If you would like to go above and beyond and support the channel further, you can on our YouTube page, hit the join button. And for just one buck a month, you will become a member of the Jams and Tea family and get yourself entitled to particular perks, such as having your name mentioned in the title scroll of every episode in this podcast, having priority comment response, and of course, having a priority if you want to recommend us something, it'll go to the top of the pile to listen. Uh, we will be back on Tuesday with uh, me, Jake, and Jacob will be back to do a record club episode on the Velvet Underground's White Light, White Heat. Yeah. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Olive Garden. We're all family here. Uh, so Rolo Tomasi are a English yeah let's just call them hardcore for the time being uh because they they did start out as a oh my god burst <laughs> 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 oh my god okay so i don't know what happened on your end just now <laughs> this fellow oh. unplugged my microphone <laughs> so rollo tomasi are... <laughs> <A nuisance. laughs> So God, God himself doesn't want you to. <laughs> I mean, or God, just the, God, just the dog backwards. Yeah, I was gonna say it's just, just, just dog. like that uh, torn flesh album. Gay rights? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> so, time will die and love will bury it. <laughs> the last time I ever introduced anything on this goddamn show. <laughs>